Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by our merchandise store. You can get t-shirts, sweatshirts, onesies. Mugs, pillows. All sorts of good stuff. Great way to start the new year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you can get it all at bit.ly slash I Know Dino store. This week in our 266th episode, we're doing our best of 2019 and there were a lot of really awesome discoveries. It was a very difficult one to put together because there was so much to go through. <laughs> that happens every year. It does, yeah. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Futalonkosaurus, and a really quick fun fact at the end. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank our patrons who keep the podcast running. We've now made it through our fifth year. It's been five full years. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Half a decade. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it's been that long, but I guess 266 episodes is a fair number. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and some of the patrons we'd like to thank for helping us get to this milestone are Scotty, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklov, Risa, Kelly, Manda, Laurasaurus, Timmy, James Pasco, Gabe, TRX Dinosaurs, and Michael. Yeah, thank you so much to everybody. We really appreciate all your support, and I we mentioned this a lot, but we really couldn't keep the show going without you. So, yeah, especially through 2019, most of our funding came from our patrons. So, paying for the hosting and keeping the website up, and all of those little details or trips, <laughs> at least partially, definitely need the patron support for that. And we really appreciate that you help us keep the podcast going. Yeah. And also to kick off 2020, we just launched an ARC server for all of our patrons, the ARC Survival Evolved video game for Steam specifically. I don't think there's a cross-play option. I think you have to do it through Steam, but I, I do believe you can do that on both Mac and PC, or at least you could do a boot camp on Mac, definitely, and do Steam through that. And yeah, it's pretty fun. So you can join us and tame your own dinosaurs in that game. It's pretty fun. I've already spent a few hours in there making a little hut, and I've tamed a Pteranodon and uh, Tech Parasaurolophus. It's kind of a weird thing, <laughs> but it's, it's fun. Anyway, if you're interested in that, check out our Patreon post where I have a link to the server. Yeah, we also have a Discord if you want to keep talking with us or other dinosaur enthusiasts, so all of that good stuff and more. You can join our growing community. It's on patreon.com slash I know dino. But without further ado, we're going to jump into our best of 2019. And the first one is very long. I considered it putting a little bit later because it's very long. <laughs> but it was also very big news. It was, I think, by far the biggest news in 2019. Some people knew about it before 2019, but it was pretty hush hush. And it's the new site, which is known as the Tana site, and captures the moment the dinosaurs went extinct we believe, in really great detail. So we're going to start with that. This article was written by Robert De Palma and others and published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, also known as PNAS. And it's titled, A Seismically Induced Onshore Surge Deposit at the KPG Boundary, North Dakota. And from that title, you can tell that it is about the KPG boundary, meaning the thing that wiped out the dinosaurs. But we're talking about North Dakota, so it's pretty far from the actual impact. Right. And you may have seen a bunch of different news articles with headlines about the day the dinosaurs died kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, that was the general trend. Although the word dinosaur is not mentioned once in the entire article, and the only dinosaur that's mentioned is mentioned briefly in the supplemental material. So not really about dinosaurs, but it is incredibly important to dinosaurs. And then the New Yorker had a piece that really covered all sorts of stuff that wasn't actually in the peer-reviewed journal article. So we're going to talk about that too. And again, thanks to everybody who shared this article and various news coverage pieces about it with us. So you might recognize the lead author's name, De Palma. He named Dakota Raptor back in 2015. It's a good one. It is. Definitely one of my favorite dinosaurs now. Mm Mm-hmm. Some good paleo art with that, too. Yeah, there was some really good stuff. But also on the author list are Peter Larson, who we talked to a while ago. He's one of the big T-Rex, kind of for-profit, a little bit controversial that way, 
in the paleontology community. And then Walter Alvarez, who is one of the guys, one of the Alvarezes <laughs> who named the Alvarez hypothesis that it was the Chicxulub impact in the Yucatan Peninsula that wiped out the dinosaurs along with that iridium layer. So some pretty big names. And there's also a lot of other people who we wouldn't recognize by name because they don't deal with dinosaurs. They deal with sedimentology and the KPG boundary that are involved in this paper. So a little bit star studded. Cool. Yeah. So what they described was this new site in southwest North Dakota, which is near the Montana border. And it's part of the Hell Creek formation. It's actually pretty close to kind of the actual Hell Creek <laughs> because that's in eastern Montana. So it's like in that area. And Hell Creek, you know, is with the T-Rex and all that kind of stuff. It's at the very end of the Cretaceous, really the end of the Maastrichtian. So it's like the end of the end of the Cretaceous. And they call the site the Tanus site after a city in Egypt where archaeologists found a sort of Rosetta Stone-like document with three different languages on it. And that's because they think the site is so important that it has like this Tanus sort of level of significance. It unlocks some secrets. Exactly. And it definitely is a pretty amazing site. It already has a lengthy Wikipedia page with over a dozen sources because so many different news media pieces have interviewed different paleontologists and dug together little bits and pieces from all over the place. Had dug together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there like I said, there isn't a lot of dinosaur related stuff in the actual article. So we had to get this from a lot of sources, which is why I was reading so much for the last couple of days. <laughs> so the Tana site is reported to be over a meter thick of stratigraphy, basically representing just a few hours when the Chicxulub impactor hit and then just a couple hours after that, which is really crazy because we believe based on what's there that there are actually individual layers from different hours. So in a couple of interviews, De Palma has called it like a slow motion camera <laughs> in terms of paleontology of what was happening. It's just really cool. So within that 1.3 meter thick or about four feet thick of those few hours, they apparently excavated over 400 cubic meters of sediment. Wow. Which, if it's about 1.3 meters thick, means that it's about 307 square meters, which works out to over 3,000 square feet of excavation. Pretty big. That's a, yeah, it's a ton. Usually, you know, when you're excavating a dinosaur, it might be like 15 feet long, maybe 5 feet tall, 10 feet tall. Mm -hmm. This is like... 20 times that big. And I don't even know, there aren't a lot of details on just how big the site is and things like that, but I know that work is still ongoing there. So there's more than this amount to be dug up for sure. And De Palma has been working on the area since at least 2012 too. So this is at least seven years of cumulative work at this point. Pretty good. They call the 1.3 meter thick piece that's like supposed to be over those few hours and quote unquote, event deposit. So it's just like a deposit of a single event is the idea. Basically, the way it works out is that the base of the event deposit is sandstone that's made up of a point bar. And a point bar is basically a sandbar at the edge of a meandering river. So if you imagine you've got like your river moving around and then there's kind of like those silty edges, kind of like a beach, I guess. It's like loose sand at the edges. They form these little bars like a sandbar and then if it gets fossilized, obviously it turns into sandstone. Now, combining that with the fact that it's in southwest North Dakota, we believe that the Tana site was along a river, which was kind of headed towards the western interior seaway. So if you imagine you've got this like ancient river meandering through the Dakotas, headed towards the western interior seaway, which filled up a lot of Montana, and then, you know, kind of spread out a little bit as it went south. That's sort of the ecological situation that we're in. And really, in that sandstone, they don't describe anything special. It's just kind of the base layer. Then at the very top, above the event deposit, is the typical iridium dust layer that's seen all over the world at the KPG boundary. So presumably, the asteroid that hit in Mexico had a lot of iridium in it. And when it vaporized and it hit the ground, it like left this dust cloud that went all up in the atmosphere, got all over the earth and then like slowly settled down. It's pretty amazing to think how that ended up all over the earth. <laughs> yeah, we've we've found this layer all over the place. And when you do the argon dating in it, when you can, you find that it's all around the same age. That's 66 million years ago, period. So basically, 
the idea is this 1.3 meters in between that dust layer and the fossilized sandstone is all stuff that happened in like within the day or however long it would take for that iridium dust to settle. All that stuff had to pile up. (laughs) So usually when you find the iridium layer, it's right on top of what would be that sandstone bed. But in this case, we just got a whole bunch of other material kind of shoved in between. Mm -hmm. So there's a ton of really interesting stuff in that event deposit. But I kind of wanted to set the stage for what actually was the event deposit because most things kind of glazed over how we knew what it was. So in there, we've got lots of sediment moving all over the place. It's got all sorts of interesting little layers in it. And it's also got tons of tektites, which are basically like glass marbles that are formed when you have a meteor or asteroid impacts the Earth and then a whole bunch of sand or silica from somewhere gets sublimated or blasted out as like molten glass all over the Earth. And then it rains back down as kind of like glass hail. Ooh, bet that caused a lot of death. Yeah, for sure. And we've talked before about how that effect also could have caused some of the fires because condensation releases a lot of heat. And so you could think of it like the meteor hit, it turned a lot of the energy into molten glass by melting it, then it spread all over the earth, and then it released that energy when the molten glass resolidified. Okay. Or went from gas to liquid. I'm not sure exactly what phase it was in throughout the process. So in this 1.3 meters of sediment, you can actually see the the marble-like shape of the yeah. tektite? Okay. Yeah. So it's not flattened. No. Yeah. So they're the tektites usually stay round because since they're glass, they're like pretty hard and they don't usually get smashed too much. Mm-hmm. But sometimes they're called micro tektites too because they're pretty small. The biggest ones there were about 1.5 millimeters in diameter. So that, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty tiny. Right. But I feel like I can call them a tektite and not a micro tektite because you could see it with the naked eye, 1.5 millimeters. Sure. But as you got to the top of the layer, they got a lot smaller. So at the top, I think they were as small as like six microns. Hmm. And that's like a tenth of a human hair, sort of. And so that's definitely micro tech type Mm -hmm. kind of size. But that's part of the story is like what we see is that at the bottom of the event deposit, you have these larger tech tights. And at the top, you have much smaller tech tights. So basically, the assumption there is that these tech tights are going flying (laughs) out from the impact crater. And the big ones don't go as high, so they land sooner. Mm -hmm. And he even talks a little bit about how if you look around the world, say in Haiti, which is pretty close to the impact site, you find these really big tektites, like say up to eight millimeters. But if you go really far away, like say to Europe or something, you only find little tiny ones. And here you see big ones at the bottom, but then you also see smaller ones as you go up. Mm -hmm. So I guess what's happening is they're going higher and higher up and then it takes them longer to fall down. Or it could be that they have a lower terminal velocity. So they go up and then the air kind of slows them down a little bit more, like dust settles a lot more slowly. And actually, originally what they were thinking was, okay, you've got these tektites landing and we know this is an event deposit. So what's happening is the tsunami came in and it washed all this sediment there and then the tektites landed in it. But what they realized was the tektites go so fast because they have models of how fast the ejecta went from the crater. Mm -hmm. And it was going crazy fast because the meteor hit so crazy fast. So much energy that they're estimating it was going more than 10 times the speed of sound. So it only took about 15 minutes to make it all the way to North Dakota (laughs) from Mexico. And because of that, there's no way the tsunami could have made it there that fast. Mm Mm-hmm. So what they ended up deciding is that it was probably caused by an actual seiche. And a seiche is this really weird thing that happens where basically an earthquake causes a lake or a river or really any body of water to sort of slosh back and forth. And when it sloshes, it pushes all sorts of stuff up the banks of the river or up the sides of the lake bed. And by stuff, you mean rock? Well, it could be anything. So there's, (laughs) for example, there was this huge seiche in... Alaska in I think the early 1900s and there's a boat that got pushed up wow because there was a huge earthquake Alaska gets big earthquakes and there was just this <laughs> lake that was in just the right spot and it just went sloshing and you know shoved everything that was on the surface if it was at the edge mm-hmm. you know it could just get kind of stuck sort of like at the edge of a draining bathtub or something you know it just leaves stuff behind along the edges as it oh, drains down yeah or sloshes to the other side crazy yeah <laughs> 
So basically, that's what they think was happening here. And as it sloshed in, it left all this sediment. And then when it kind of went back out, like low tide sort of thing, it left a bunch of stuff on the beach, basically. So what we're left with in this 1.3 meters is sort of a layer cake of stratigraphy. And there's at least four individual directions the water moved. Like it went in, it went out, and then it went in again, and then out again. So you can kind of measure that based on the way that the fish (laughs) are oriented in the stratigraphy. Oh, the poor fish. Yeah. So there are literally fish. There's tons of fish in this deposit, and they're, they're pointed in direction with the way the water was going. So, yeah, that's one way to tell where it was going. Right. (laughs) And then on top of that, the really cool thing is that with those layers, you can see the tektites, the really big tektites, especially like the over a millimeter size ones. You can see them leaving a little crater and it kind of pulls the layer cake down. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. I mean, they were going terminal velocity, so hundreds of miles an hour probably. And it was probably pretty soft sediment too based on the fact that it could bend it like that you know it wasn't going into rock Mm -hmm. and if it was rock the glass probably would have just broken and not made a big divot in it so based on that they think okay yeah it must have been soft you know sediment just like silt from the bottom of the river gets washed up and then this little glass ball comes flying down at hundreds of miles an hour and then leaves this big divot in it it's really cool looking sounds like a really scary time (laughs) yeah for sure just another element to that And one more note about the seiche, too. They estimate, based on kind of limited data we have about seiches, that it could have, quote, easily generated seiches worldwide with amplitudes of the order 10 to 100 meters, end quote. And that's so all over the world. They think the Chicxulub impact going upwards of 300 feet, potentially, on the high end, 30 feet on the low end. Wow. Yeah. And that kind of agrees with the model we saw of sort of where the tsunami went all over the world. I was saying like 10 meters seems to be where it reached all over the world from that model. So what happens is the Chicxulub impact happens. Then all these glass marbles start (laughs) raining down. And then you have the seiches and the water levels are just going crazy and sloshing everything around. Yeah, everything becomes a tsunami. But on top of that, you also have the crazy burst of wind that comes through and like blows out everything's eardrums. Right. And kills a lot of things nearby just with the pressure. But that's nearby worldwide. That would go pretty far, yeah. That would definitely go thousands of miles. And then everything bursts into flames with the glass condensing right. and the energy. And then also, yeah, the flooding from everything. Basically every kind of natural catastrophe type yeah. event. And then nuclear winter for a couple of years. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely bad. <laughs> and yet things survived. Yeah, some things. Mammalian ancestors survived. Yes. There's a little bit about that in this too, mm. but not in the actual paper. Again, just kind of in the hearsay portion So the things that they actually did describe specifically in the paper that have been peer reviewed, I want to emphasize the things that have been peer reviewed versus just sort of casually mentioned. So the peer review includes a piece of amber with microtectites in it, which is just crazy. I don't think that's ever been found before. It's really useful for chemistry because it preserves the glass then in the original state and we can see potentially more details about what was in the meteorite or what was in the dirt when it went flying. There's a school of fish that, like I said, are facing the same direction (laughs) of the flow with, quote, ejecta clustered in the gill region, end quote. Oh. Yeah, so they think that the fish probably suffocated from their gills getting clogged. That's probably the best way they could have You want to go quick, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. They also noted that their mouths are open, which is apparently something fish often do when they're trying to move more water over their lungs. You might have seen that happen if you've had a pet fish that you didn't properly care for. (laughs) I've definitely seen it before. (laughs) There's a brief mention about ammonites, which was mostly just to point out that there were marine and freshwater species mixed together during the crazy destruction. Oh, because of all the sloshing around and everything getting mixed together. Exactly. So they think that it was like, okay, we're in a river headed towards the Western Interior Seaway, right? So Mm -hmm. it's mostly freshwater stuff. But then the Western Interior Seaway sloshes on up all the way back up the river Mm. and you're getting all these ammonites. That would have killed them as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just like the pressure and like the change in If you're freshwater versus saltwater, yeah. Yeah. All that stuff. But, you know, even just suffocating because they even though they found these microtectites near the gills, it could have also just been full of sand, too. You know, if it's getting shoved through all this silty water. That could have suffocated it, too. 
But when you're <laughs> digging a fish fossil out of sandstone, it's hard to tell if there was sand on the gills because <laughs> it's like, you know, it's full of sand. Mm -hmm. But the tectites are still there at least. They also specifically mention both paddlefish, which are freshwater, as well as sturgeon, which I think they're thinking was freshwater, but I know that sturgeon can sometimes be from marine environments too, so I'm not sure exactly what kind of sturgeon they are. Then in the supplemental material, they also mention a lot of other stuff. They mention shark, mosasaur, and fish teeth all clumped together. So there's, you know, there's a big mix of mosasaur. That's crazy. You know, huge mosasaur. Their teeth are getting in there. There must have been so much confusion right before the end. Yeah. I'm guessing the bigger the animal is, the quicker it died. Because like how far does a mosasaur get sloshed around before it's unconscious? Right. Versus like a fish or, you know, an ammonite or something. Maybe it could hang on a little longer. And then they didn't say that they found like a mosasaur skull. So it could potentially just be that like a, a tooth that fell out of a mosasaur got washed inland too. Right. It's hard to say. But there definitely would not have been mosasaur teeth in a river headed towards the western interior sea mm -hmm. <laughs> under normal circumstances or shark teeth for that matter. This kind of completely, I don't know how to phrase this, but we've talked before about this impact and the destruction and everything. And sometimes we've thought, oh, maybe it would have been good to be a water creature. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but no, it was bad for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Every water environment is at least like 30 feet of waves. Mm -hmm. If it's deep, I mean, you know, the deeper you are, probably the better off you are, would be my guess. But even then, who knows? <laughs> because your ecosystem's collapsing. Right. And then it might just be a slow death rather than Which a quick... could be worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another interesting thing about the teeth, it's not just what type of teeth they were. They also analyzed the oxygen-18 isotope in them, which correlates with the level of salinity that the animal was living in to kind of compare the marine to fresh water. So they found a pretty wide variation there. So kind of showed, yes, the shark tooth was from a marine environment. <laughs> and this, you know, paddlefish was from a freshwater environment. So just more confirmation on that. It's always good to have multiple sources. And then in non-animal world, they also found a tree trunk, which I think is where that amber was attached to with the microtectites, a section of a palm frond, and some other plants. So a lot of really interesting stuff. But like I said, the word dinosaur is nowhere in the article. In that supplemental material, though, they do mention a ceratopsian ilium, which is a hip bone that was already exposed in the area. And then they did a little digging. Well, we know the dinosaurs were affected. <laughs> yes, for sure. So, I mean, you can definitely infer from this crazy environment and the fact that we know it was a KPG boundary, that this was the day the dinosaur died or whatever title you want from it. Mm -hmm. But Really, this was about a bunch of fish dying. <laughs> really, all the article was about, at least, other than a little bit in the supplemental material. So that's everything that was officially published in the PNAS article. It's been peer-reviewed. It's gone through scientific rigor. But even with that, you know, the peer review process continues on after the publication. So there's a chance that someone will look at this and say, that's not a sturgeon, that's a whatever kind of fish. And there'll be some more refinements. But generally, you know, I think we can be pretty confident that this is a deposit from the KPG boundary, that at least it is before the KPG boundary, because we have that iridium layer on top of it. There could be some debate about whether or not it was immediately after the impact. But the fact that there are all these tectites through it, it seems pretty solid. Right. The stuff I'm about to say, not so much, <laughs> because it was just published in an article in The New Yorker, and there's no scientific requirements of that. And in fact, a lot of it was done kind of by just Robert De Palma. So a lot of his co-authors might not have even seen this stuff. So it's really just like one guy's opinion at this point. And one thing that was a little bit frustrating about it too, is that this article came out three days before the PNAS article. So a lot of people were expecting tons of this stuff to be in the real journal article. And then when we got access to it, we we're like, wait, this is just sedimentology and tectites right. and a couple of fish. Where's all the dinosaurs? <laughs> so anyway, getting into it. Apparently, Robert De Palma contacted the New Yorker back in 2013, and he required some pretty intense secrecy about this find. And the New Yorker titled their article, The Day the Dinosaurs Died, a young paleontologist may have discovered a record of the most significant event in the history of life on Earth. Which quote. is 
quite the title. It is. I don't even think it's the most significant mass extinction in the history of Earth, let alone event. <laughs> it might be in terms of the number of people interested in it. Maybe. I mean, the great dying in like the Permian. Right. That is pretty epic. That was much bigger. The Cambrian explosion is also way more important. But anyway, we don't have to get into these semantics. They also said that more than 99.9999% of all living organisms on Earth died, which I think might be a little bit of hyperbole. Mm. Because I don't think like all the bacteria died, and that's probably most of the living organisms. But anyway, I don't want to poke too many holes in it because there's going to be a lot of other holes to poke. Yeah, it's a nitpicky one. <laughs> yeah. So the picture and the language associated with this is kind of all about presenting Robert De Palma as like a superhero paleontologist. So it's not too surprising that it's mostly just like his firsthand accounts of what he found. And that, I mean, that's kind of what he was going for, you know, in contacting the New Yorker and giving them some exclusive information and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Interestingly, he says he never digs on public land because he prefers to work with private landowners and get exclusive rights. And sometimes he even sells the fossils to raise money. So he's not like a typical paleontologist. Right. He doesn't go through the traditional channels that most paleontologists go through. Most paleontologists, at least paleontologists that publish in peer-reviewed journals, tend to work for a major university, and they tend to work mostly on public land. They'll get, you know, just permission to go on various public sites and dig for fossils. And if they do go on private sites, they either try to get them donated or they try to get a donor to buy it. And they're not really allowed to buy it, so sometimes that can get a little bit dicey. Mm -hmm. But once they do buy it, it goes into the museum collection, and it's definitely never sold. Right. So this is a, a little bit of a different process. It's a little bit more like Pete Larson at Black Hills Institute, who does some paleontology, but also does some fossil dealing. So I think some paleontologists from the outset might be a little bit uncomfortable with this discovery, just from the fact that a guy who sells fossils is the one writing about it. Right. But that doesn't mean that his findings aren't valid. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So as usual, he has secured exclusive rights to the Tana site for some undisclosed amount of money, according to The New Yorker. And it's described in The New Yorker as being standard practice. But like we explained, like that's not really standard practice. <laughs> like it is sort of standard practice that you have to pay landowners when they want money but really, it's more common for them to donate it, I would say. That would probably be the standard practice. And a lot of paleontologists, since this article came out, have criticized the fact that he has exclusive access to the site and they can't get in there and see the fossils as well. But, you know, museums pull this kind of stuff all the time, too, with access to their collections. So I don't, I don't know. One interesting thing about that, too, is the New Yorker basically justified all of the secrecy about the fact that he's been digging there since 2012 and not really sharing the information with the public or with his fellow scientists in terms of the bone wars from the 1800s. They're like, oh, this isn't, you know, secrecy isn't new to paleontology because there was this thing called the bone wars and everything had to be secret. It's like, that is not where we are now. Just because that happened 100 something years ago. A <laughs> lot has changed in the last century. Has. Yeah. The level of secrecy does not need to be nearly as high. No one's going to get in there and steal his stuff. Or destroy anything. Yeah. And even if there are things you can do if you're afraid of that. So sometimes people will camouflage the exact location of the site. But he didn't really even do that in there. He has a pretty detailed map of where it is. It's not like, I don't think he has GPS coordinates, but it's not the kind of thing where it would be super hard to figure out where it was. Anyway, there's a large list of things in the New Yorker article that aren't in the paper. So I'm going to go through some of them. First, there was a jaw of a small mammal. And they said, quote, this one was already dead when it was buried, end quote. And later that it was a relative to primates. So I don't know why you That's know that it was prove. already dead when it was buried. Yeah. And that, was, <laughs> that it was a relative to primates. There was one criticism of De Palma later in the article where they said that he tends to like overinterpret or sometimes like use extra flowery language that might not be warranted. Oh, the New Yorker article said that? Yes, because they talked to some other paleontologists about him to try to, because they couldn't actually ask the paleontologist much about what they thought of his work because it hadn't been published yet. Okay. So all they could do was ask about like, well, what do you think about Robert De Palma? And some of them were like, I don't know who that is. And other ones are like, 
Oh, yeah, I remember that one time he mentioned a Dakota Raptor and accidentally included some other bone in it. But I don't really think that's fair, though, because the Dakota Raptor find was really good. And just because it had one other bone in it, he still did really good science on that. Mm. But like you can tell from that that the color commentary is really at a high (laughs) level in the New Yorker article. It's not just scientific fact. He also found something that he says looks like a mammal's burrow with potentially a mammal still inside it. And that it might have been born in the Cretaceous and died in the Paleogene, which is kind of a cool thought. Yeah, it is. Because <laughs> it seems to have burrowed down through that iridium layer. So it's like it survived and then like dug back in terms of sedimentology into the past. <laughs> and that's where it died. It's pretty crazy. They found something that's either a flower or an echinoderm, which is a marine creature. So Very different. Yeah. They also found a dinosaur feather, which they say is over a foot long and possibly from the forearm of a Dakota raptor. So one of the articles I read, they talked about how the quill knob on the Dakota raptor forearm matches the size of the feather quill at about three and a half millimeters, which is pretty massive for a feather quill. And if it's over a foot long, it makes sense that it would be so big. I was hoping, though, in the New Yorker article, because they start talking about these theropod feathers that he found, that he was going to say, like, and we found this tyrannosaur bone next to it. Hmm. And then it would be like the first evidence of a feathered tyrannosaur. But we don't have that yet. (laughs) Maybe someday. (laughs) Maybe. One can hope. They found a six foot long fish. It's pretty massive, possibly with gut contents. Nice. And he says it's likely a new species. Like I mentioned before, there's a ceratopsian hip bone. And in the New Yorker article, they talk about how it was previously discovered by a different paleontologist who had bought rights to the land to do some digging up of dinosaurs. And then they excavated part of this fossilized hip and then decided like, eh, it's not worth continuing to excavate. It doesn't look like there's going to be any awesome ceratopsian skull attached to it or anything. And then gave up and then De Palma wanted it for the exact reason that this guy didn't want it. (laughs) So that guy looked at it and said, it looks like it all got deposited at the same time. I don't want that. It doesn't look like the typical, you know, like even small layers where you find these great dinosaur fossils. And De Palma had previously worked on something similar with these fine layers sort of near the KPG boundary and, you know, was really excited to get it. (laughs) So that's kind of funny. But in the New Yorker article, they say there's a quote, suitcase size piece of fossilized skin from a ceratopsian, end quote, Hmm. which sounds pretty fantastical. And it's probably hyperbole because in the supplemental material, it talks about how there's a skin impression from a ceratopsian, which is very different than fossilized skin and also much more likely in sandstone like this. Right. So, oops. (laughs) They also found ammonites that they say were tossed inland. There's an ant's nest with ants inside, a possible wasp burrow, another mammal burrow, quote, with multiple tunnels and galleries, end quote, several shark teeth, a large sea turtle femur, several new fish species, a plant that might have been related to the banana, (laughs) (laughs) and, quote, more than a dozen new species of animals and plants and several other burrow types, end quote which is all just crazy. This is an amazing number of things. That makes sense. Everything got mixed up. Yeah, but like the level of preservation. But you're right. The variety of stuff is just crazy. They also found what they're describing as an unhatched egg with an embryo inside it, which I think has only been found once or twice before. Mm -hmm. And they also said that, quote, at the bottom of the deposit, in a mixture of heavy gravel and tectites, De Palma identified the broken teeth and bones, including hatchling remains, of almost every dinosaur group known from the Hell Creek, as well as pterosaur remains, end quote. That's a lot of different dinosaurs. It's a very bold claim, because <laughs> that would be pterosaurs, ceratopsians, hadrosaurs, ornithomimosaurs, ankylosaurs, hypsilophodonts, dromaeosaurs, pachycephalosaurs. All kinds of theropods. Yeah. So if they found all of those things and some of them as hatchlings, that would just be amazing. Does that mean the Saurian team has a lot of updating to do? (laughs) Oh, God. I hope not. I feel so bad for them at this point. If they found a Tyrannosaur feather, then they'd have to like, maybe they could just undo it. They just go back to the old Gen 1 Tyrannosaur with feathers at that point. (laughs) But this is, I guess, is 
technically unconfirmed or unpeer reviewed. Yeah, this is all just like basically hearsay from one person. Although, you know, he is a paleontologist and he's the one that's been working on it. Right. So it could be his next few papers. Yes. So that's what a lot of people are expecting, that there's going to be more papers coming out and it's going to have all this stuff in it, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, we're all expecting now. Yeah. (laughs) Come on, Robert. Speed up. (laughs) (laughs) But like I mentioned before, there has been a lot of criticism, partly about the way that the New Yorker described things and the fact that they didn't really emphasize that this stuff hadn't been peer reviewed and what was included in the paper and what wasn't since the paper hadn't come out yet. And also for publishing early. But it turns out that the New Yorker found out that somebody else wasn't following the PNAS embargo because they weren't. Uh, no one was supposed to publish about this until the official journal article came out. And when the New Yorker found out about it, they asked PNAS if they could publish early too so that they didn't get scooped because right. they were supposed to have like this pretty exclusive interview and access. That makes sense. They put a lot of work into it and they have this whole audio part to it. Yeah, exactly. And then so PNAS said, yeah, sure, you can if you're going to get scooped, you can publish early because somebody's publishing early anyway. This seems to happen a lot, a lot more than I would have thought before yeah. we started this podcast. <laughs> I don't know how they keep sending these articles to people that <laughs> disrespect the embargoes. Maybe they don't. Maybe now PNAS won't send anything to whoever that was. Nobody disclosed it either. I was yeah. like, wow, you really. Well, the last time we heard about it, nobody disclosed who was breaking the embargo either. Yeah, man. It's crazy. I guess maybe it's some kind of journalist code I don't know about. Yeah, could be. Yeah, so you can be mad at The New Yorker for using too flowery of language, but you shouldn't be mad at them for publishing early because they didn't really have a choice. <laughs> but then there's, like I said, there's been so, a lot of criticism from other scientists too, mostly around the fact that it's so secretive because the quicker that information spreads throughout the scientific community, the quicker we can move forward and learn more and more and more. And also the more scientists that can get involved, the better. And De Palma's kind of hoarding it. So people are jealous, basically. (laughs) And then there are people who, like I saw a comment where someone is researching something similar and they're like, oh, I really want to find out about that specific marine mollusk or whatever that he hinted at because I'm working on that. But it's since it's so secretive, he can't get access to it. So that's the Tana site. It's a lot to share. Yep. But I mean, that footnote of it should have every type of dinosaur that's been in the Hell Creek is pretty crazy. And over a dozen new species. Mm -hmm. But like, we don't really know what any of that means. (laughs) Yet. All right. If you're still with us after that (laughs) monster best of, I think that was about a half hour. We're going to move on to our best new Tyrannosaur, which is Suski Tyrannus. There was also Morose, which was discovered, but Suski Tyrannus was later, and we talk about Morose in this one, so it made the decision easy because this one actually includes both. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) but I think Suski Tyrannus was a little bit better of a discovery, a little more exciting. It's a new Tyrannosaur that was found last week, and it was published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, which unfortunately is behind a paywall. But thanks to everyone who shared it with us on Discord and Patreon. This paper was published by Sterling J. Nesbitt and others, but it includes a lot of people who we've interviewed on the show before, including Steve Brusati, Jim Kirkland, and Andrew McDonald, who we interview later in this episode. <laughs> so jumping into this new dinosaur, it's named Suski Tyrannus. A lot of people are just calling it Suski, which I like because that's easy to say. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds nice, too. Yeah. Very friendly sounding. It does, unlike how it probably behaved in real life. Well, yeah. <laughs> and its species name is Hazel A. Suski Tyrannus comes from the word Suski, which is Zuni for coyote. And that's apparently because it was called the coyote of the Cretaceous for decades prior to its official naming. Interesting. And then when it came around to name it, they were like, okay, yeah, we'll stick with coyote. But let's make it something more interesting than just coyote in English. And they used the Zuni language because of where it was found. And then Hazel A is after Hazel Wolf for work at the Moreno Hill Formation. So well earned. As you could guess, it was found in the Moreno Hill Formation in New Mexico. And it was found in the Pueblo of Zuni, where much if not all of the Moreno Hill Formation is located. And the tribe has previously been honored by Zuni Ceratops. So the name Zuni might be familiar. Suski is from the late Cretaceous, about 
92 million years ago. That's basically how old the formation is. And they actually found it way back in 1998. In this case, it's really interesting because the discoverer is the same person as the lead author, which a lot of times isn't the case when there's a 20-year gap in between yeah. <laughs> the fossil discovery and the publication. So PBS actually has some great pictures and interview information about this find. And they spoke with Sterling Nesbitt, the lead author and discoverer, who found it when he was 16. I think he was with a group, so I'm not sure if he was technically the first person to see it. But there are pictures of him when he's 16 pointing at bones that are still completely buried in mud other than <laughs> the little part sticking out. So he was definitely there at the very beginning. That's cool. It comes full circle. It does. And there's also one of the pictures was taken by Hazel Wolf, who the species is named after. So they've clearly been involved ever since 1998. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, definitely been working there for a long time and deserving of the species name. They actually found two individuals, which is always great because then you get a little bit more information about the dinosaur and you're less likely to describe the dinosaur based on things that are just individual variation from the dinosaur. But unfortunately, there isn't a lot of overlap between the two dinosaurs. So one of them is basically just the jaws and two neck vertebrae. So not a lot. It's kind of like part of the upper jaw and part of the lower jaw. It's not even a full upper jaw or lower jaw. But they still decided to pick that one for the holotype, probably because a lot of times skulls are a little more diagnostic. They tend to have more differences between species. So I'm guessing that's why they picked it as the holotype. And then the other find was a lot more complete. It had much less of the skull, though. It had kind of the tip of the bottom jaw and then a little bit of the post orbital, so kind of behind the eye. And then also about a dozen vertebrae pieces, much of both legs and feet, and a few fragments from the hips and just two finger claws, but nothing else from the arm, really. <laughs> So it's kind of weird that they just at the very end. A lot of time you see the opposite where the claws are missing. This time it's just the claws. Both of the individuals are about the same size, so they analyze them together, kind of treating it like it was just one dinosaur. When they're comparing it, when they laid out the pieces together and stuff, you can basically just treat it like it was one dinosaur in terms of how big it was and description of it. But we know that it's not the same dinosaur because there's a couple bones that overlap. So dinosaurs don't have two mouths, for example, <laughs> <laughs> so you could tell. That it's two individuals. Yeah, they're weird, but they're not that weird. Yeah, unless this is a very interesting dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> During their analysis, they took a histological section from the femur, and they say it, quote, exhibits a minimum of three widely spaced growth lines with no sign of decreasing growth rate. For example, similar tissues throughout the cortex and no secondary osteons indicating that the individual was young and actively growing at the time of death, end quote. So in other words, it was about three years old and it was still growing rapidly, which is what you'd expect because as far as we know with tyrannosaurs, a lot of them reached skeletal maturity in like their teens. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that it was still growing rapidly when it was three. It's pretty young for a dinosaur in general, actually. Yeah. Based on the bone structure, they think it grew a little bit more like early theropods than T-Rex. And therefore, it wouldn't have reached the same massive size as T-Rex. Also not surprising since it's 92 million years old. So we're talking almost 30 million years before T-Rex. And we know a lot of those earlier tyrannosaurs were smaller, even at adult size. In their recreation, they recreate it with three fingers, which is pretty typical for an uh, early theropod hand. Although all they found were just the claws from the first and second fingers. So... I'm not sure how confident they are <laughs> in this restoration, but phylogenetically speaking, it does seem like it probably still had three fingers, a little bit more like a normal theropod than the weird features that T-Rex would later have. Mm -hmm. like it doesn't have that same huge, disproportionately massive skull. It's still a little bit more normal sized. <laughs> Hasn't quite specialized yet. Yeah, yeah. It's not quite in that super weird alpha predator mode yet. Which I think is partly why they call it the coyote of the Cretaceous, too, because they expect that it wasn't the apex predator. So just like a coyote has to be maybe a little bit more adaptable and mm -hmm. maybe scavenging from time to time and things like that. From the pieces that they found, they estimate the skull was about a foot or 30 centimeters long. So that's a decent sized skull. 
and they can tell that its snout was broad and U-shaped like later tyrannosauroids. If you've ever looked at some of these dinosaur fossils straight on, you know that things like Allosaurus have actually a pretty narrow head. But usually when you look at dinosaurs, you're looking at them from kind of a profile view. And uh, something like an Allosaurus doesn't look that different than something like a Mm T-Rex because they both have pretty long heads. But when you look at them straight on, you can see this really big difference. And this one's already starting to get a wider head. So even though it's smaller and the head isn't proportionally huge on its body, it is starting to get a little more robust. Maybe it had a stronger bite force than some other similar theropods at the time, and it's starting to specialize a little bit, but they didn't have a real complete skull, so I'm not sure how much they can tell about its bite force. They didn't talk about it in the paper, obviously, because this is just the first description. It also has those characteristic D-shaped teeth and a set of four small teeth in the premaxilla at the front of the mouth that we're really used to seeing in T-Rex that might tell you a little bit about its diet. In with the paper, there's one of those really nice skeletal drawings by Scott Hartman showing all of the bones that were found and then, you know, which ones were from which of the two individuals as well as which ones overlap and a lot of interpretation from the other relatives, obviously, like how the other fingers were shaped and how bulky its rib cage would have been and things like that. And basically everything about the tail because they found very little of that. I'm guessing that he finished his drawing a few months ago at least, because last month he had a post where he talked about how he was adding lips to all of his new, quote, non-beaked, non-avian theropod skeleton reconstructions, end quote, which would definitely include this one because it doesn't have a beak. (laughs) Right. And it's a theropod. And it's a theropod, yeah. But just like a lot of the older tyrannosaurs, it's depicted as like its teeth sticking out and not having lips. But I'm guessing if he had another shot at this one, he would redraw it as a skeletal with lips covering the teeth. Hmm. And the reason he said that he started doing that is basically he thinks the majority of evidence points to having lips over teeth versus not having lips over teeth. So he might be headed in that direction generally. I don't know. It's still pretty contentious. Yeah, There's a lot of people arguing. There was a lot at SVP last year where we heard about people arguing over whether or not things had lips or whether they even needed something to protect their teeth since they shed them all the time. Overall, the skeletal drawing puts it at around a meter or three feet tall and three meters or nine feet long. When I tried to measure it, it looked a little bit smaller than that. But since it's still growing, it's only three years old, its exact size isn't really all that useful because we're basically comparing, you know, three-year-olds. It's kind of like if you took a random three-year-old human and then tried to guess how big an adult would be. (laughs) <laughs> but maybe an even bigger difference. Yeah, it's it's super hard to project that kind of thing, especially because it's like we know it's still rapidly growing. How can you even possibly make a guess at it? So at this young state, it's definitely smaller than the morose individual that was found and described in February. And PBS said that it was larger than morose and that morose was four feet tall and six feet long, which would be super weird proportions for a theropod. Nothing's ever six feet long and four feet tall. <laughs> like nothing. It's kind of has, boxy. Yeah. There's, with the tail, they're never that length and height. So I don't know. Maybe they were talking about the actual fossil block that it came out of. I'm mm. not really sure. But it could be that it was larger as an individual. I think that might be what they're going for. Because as a quick refresher, Morose was a tyrannosaur. It lived about 96 million years ago. So about 4 million years older than Suski. And the one morose individual that we have, morose individual, (laughs) was about six or seven years old. And they estimate weighed about 78 kilograms or 172 pounds when it died and was likely near adult size. So even though it was estimated to be about four feet or 1.2 meters tall at the hip, if it's twice the age of Suski, you know, maybe Suski ended up getting bigger by the time it was an adult. So. It's hard to say. Also, morose is only known from a single leg and a few toe bones and a couple teeth. So we don't have as good of an idea about the overall size of the animal, unless you just take kind of standard proportions of a tyrannosaur and say like, well, the leg is this long. So we think it was so overall body was this long, which isn't the worst thing to do, but it's obviously not the best way <laughs> to size an animal. The paper itself didn't name a specific weight for the individual. But a couple sources mentioned that they thought it was between 
20 and 40 kilograms, putting it between about 45 and 90 pounds. So then that would make Suski both about 4 million years younger and about half the weight of Morose. But again, Suski was still growing, so it's hard to say. And I think the narrative of T-Rex being at the end of this evolutionary path and therefore tyrannosaurs increasing in size generally is really driving a lot of this. So it's like, well, Suski has to be bigger because it's 4 million years younger. Right. And we know that the younger tyrannosaurs were bigger. But unfortunately, evolution isn't that simple. It's very possible that, say, Morose was on the line that actually ended up being T-Rex and Suski was on a side branch and was smaller or even more likely is probably that neither of them <laughs> were on the same branch that ended up being T-Rex, and they're just all cousins. So it's hard to say. It would be good to get a larger individual of Suski. Hopefully they can find something. And now we've got our gnarliest pathologies, which was the poor Tenontosaurus. Yeah, it had all sorts of problems. We'll go into more detail in the news item. So if you're squeamish, though, you might want to skip that. I think that's how the item starts, too. So this is a double warning about how intense it is. And I should warn that this is a little bit graphic because we're talking about severe injuries to a dinosaur. And a lot of them involve like broken bones and how they formed and infections and things like that. So if you're sensitive to that sort of thing, you might want to skip this one. But we love paleopathologies because they're fascinating. And I think they're a great window into how dinosaurs were living creatures and had to deal with all sorts of rough stuff. They weren't just these big, invulnerable creatures that got to do whatever they wanted and never had to deal with any consequences. So this specific article was written by T.C. Hunt and others and published in Scientific Reports. And it's about a sub-adult Tenontosaurus from the early Cretaceous, and it's an ornithopod, if you're not familiar with Tenontosaurus. It's often depicted being eaten. <laughs> it's sort of the life of a Tenontosaurus. It's herbivorous, and at full size, they were about 7 meters or 23 feet long. I'm not sure how big this one was because it was a subadult, so it may have been a little bit smaller. This specific individual was collected in 2001 in Oklahoma, and they found a total of five paleopathologies on it. Or I guess I could just say pathologies, because obviously if it's a dinosaur, they're paleopathologies. The first one is that the left toe and left rib, quote, are both fractured with extensive callus formation in later stages of healing, end quote. And the callus is a normal part of the bone healing process. So the fact that it was there meant that the dinosaur had at least started the process of healing. It didn't just die from these injuries. Another left rib, as well as a right rib, have, quote, impacted fractures, end quote, which shortened them both by about an inch. And I had to look up what an impacted fracture is because I'm familiar with lots of types of fractures, like compound fractures and things. But an impacted fracture, unfortunately, is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically an impact that simultaneously breaks and then jams the two parts of the bone together, Ooh. sort of like a telescope. Ouch. Yeah, it, it, it sounds terrifying, and I didn't know this was a possible thing that bones could do, but <laughs> apparently it can happen. And like I said, it shortened both of the ribs by about an inch, so an inch of the end of the rib got jammed into an inch of the other part of the rib. Pretty gnarly. The authors say that all of these pathologies are consistent with a fall, so I guess what happened is it fell, you know, it injured its toe, a rib, and then two of the ribs actually got broken and kind of jammed up. So it must have fallen kind of down directly on those ribs so that they broke and then got shoved. Ugh. Anyway, <laughs> if you're counting, I've only listed four pathologies so far. Number five is the toe and rib that have a callus appear to have a, quote, post-traumatic infection in the form of osteomyelitis, end quote. And osteomyelitis is a bone infection, is what that means. Yikes. In this case, one of the infected bones in the foot has a Brody abscess, which is a first for an herbivorous dinosaur. I think it was only the second one ever known in a non-avian dinosaur, so hmm. that's exciting. If you're wondering <laughs> what a Brody abscess is, it's a type of bone infection usually caused by a bacteria that generally stays inside a single bone. So it's not like the worst type of abscess. Right. In fact, they're kind of hard to diagnose in people 
because people also get these and they tend to be at least in people in our leg bones. Hmm. And in this case, they think that the bacteria came in through its blood oh. and then sort of spread into the bone. In humans, I think they said that it takes between months to up to 10 years to heal, but it's not a chronic condition. So it does heal eventually, but it's just kind of a infection you get. You might not know about it and then it heals slowly. I think they're quite rare in humans. They referenced maybe 25 cases that they knew about, but it's since it's inside the bone, like why would you even know it was there unless it was causing pain for some reason? And then it's hard to diagnose because it's buried in there. Anyway, the Tenontosaurus <laughs> didn't die immediately from the fall because we saw that it has those calluses forming from healing the bones, but they think that the fractures would have caused chronic pain while the Brody abscess seemed to get kind of bad and it might have caused it to limp, which put together meant that it would have needed extra food to fight the infection, but its injuries would have made it harder to get around and gather food and eventually, quote, resulting in malnutrition and a suppressed immune system, potentially leaving it susceptible to greater secondary infection, end quote. Catch 22. It is. You get infected, so you need to eat, but the infection is preventing you from getting to the food, which is making the infection worse. Not great. Poor dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> Tenontosaurus cannot catch a break. All right, we've covered pathology, so now we can get into less gnarly type things, like best new sauropod, which in 2019 was Bahadasaurus. So the article was written by Pablo Gallina and others and published in Scientific Reports, and it's a new sauropod. Like I said, it's specifically a dicreosaurid, which is the group that includes a margosaurus. And a margosaurus, again, is that sauropod, and it's got the sort of dual sets of sails, usually it's depicted, kind of running down its back. So its vertebrae have these really tall neural spines that stick out up through the skin of its neck <laughs> into the air. And then they're either covered in skin or keratin or something we don't really know why it has them. It's really weird, but it's amazing looking. It's one of the coolest looking dinosaurs. There's a couple of museums in Europe that have them on display. I don't think I've ever seen one in the U.S., though. We tend to focus on like the American sauropods like Diplodocus and Brontosaurus and things like that. I don't see a lot of Amargosaurus around here. It's also a little bit smaller, but it has those really cool spines. Anyway, <laughs> this one was found in southwest Argentina. Its name is Bahatosaurus pronospinax and bahadasaurus is from bahada which is spanish for downhill but really it's because it was found in the bahada colorada formation so it's really named after the formation more than just being downhill it's like downhill lizard is kind of a weak name but yeah it makes sense if it's in that formation and then pronospinax comes from pronus which is latin for bent forward and spinax which is greek for spine so if you put that together, you get these spines that are curving forward. And that's a really good name for it because it has spines on its back that are curving forward. <laughs> Very descriptive. Exactly. So if you know a Margosaurus has spines that don't curve, they just stick out basically straight up out of its neck. This one, on the other hand, they like have a pretty dramatic curve, like almost 90 degrees by the end of the curve forward, which looks really really strange and in addition to those spines they also found the jaw including teeth and most of the skull and then two vertebrae one of which has those really cool spines the other vertebrae is sort of the link between the skull and the neck so it doesn't have any spines because it's the bone that's known as the axis it's sort of more of like a connective joint than anything that you could stick a big <laughs> spine <laughs> on but the other one, the really impressive one that's basically the whole reason that this dinosaur is so interesting, is probably about the fifth from the head. So it's still not that large of a vertebrae overall, but the spines on it are massive. I think they said they're about four times as long as the vertebrae is long. Wow. So it's, yeah, they really stick out of there. There's no way that this could have been contained within the neck. Like there's no thickness of neck that's reasonable <laughs> that could have kept these neural spines of the vertebrae inside the neck. So they must have stuck out. Like a Margosaurus, the spines are bifurcated, meaning that they are two separate spines all the way from the base, which is, you know, still within the neck up to the top. So it's actually like a pair 
almost like the old depictions of Stegosaurus where they had the parallel plates running down the back. It sort mm-hmm. of has that look to it, except that it actually has it, <laughs> unlike Stegosaurus, where we now think they're more alternating. According to their analysis, Bahatosaurus's closest relatives are probably Lingwulong and Pilmatwea, but with such fragmentary remains, we're probably better off just saying that it's somewhere in Dicreosauridae because it's mostly based on just one vertebrae and like subtle differences. But, you know, you can have some individual variation and things that kind of makes that tricky. It's about 140 million years old, which is about the same as Pilmatwea, and they're from the same formation. So that's not surprising. That's probably they're dated the same. But like I said, some of those differences on the vertebrae and the shape of it, they think make it distinct from Pilmatwea. So they don't think that they're the same dinosaur. But who knows? The future, maybe this really cool named dinosaur might just get synonymized. Since it's 140 million years old, too, that makes it about 10 million years older than a Margosaurus, in case you're wondering, because a Margosaurus is pretty well known. So spines are, have been around for a while. Yeah, for sure. And the spines are especially strange because, like I said, they curve forward and they curve so far forward that even though the one that they found is the fifth vertebrae, so the fifth from the head, they might have almost reached the back of the head in terms of like the position forward. They wouldn't have curved downwards towards the head. But, you know, like if you imagine it kind of like a parasol or something curving up like it was going to shade the head. They're very thin, though. So, I mean, unless they had skin attaching them sort of laterally, it wouldn't have actually provided any shade. That'd be kind of a cool thing, though. Anyway, their main hypothesis is that the spines were covered in keratin sheaths. And they're basing this on previous work which concluded that a margosaurus had keratin sheaths on its spines. So no skin. That's what they're saying, yeah. But they did point out that on their specific spines, they weren't in good enough condition to really see what the interface with the air would have been like. Mm. So they can't really say that for sure. It's all just based on this margosaurus research that they think is close enough. And I I don't really think that's settled even with a margosaurus because usually I see that depicted with a connection in between the bones. Right. But one of the reasons they say that it might have had keratin sheaths is that they think the keratin might have made it stronger and then less likely to break. Whereas if it was just connected with skin, these are really thin pieces of bone and really long too. So you could see how if it was just covered in skin, then it could be pretty easy to snap off if you bumped your head on something basically (laughs) which would be awful i wonder what the point of the spines were then yeah it's really strange they had a few different hypotheses about what they could have been used for they said maybe they could have been used for defense which i think is pretty dicey since it's so thin yeah they're very thin unless the keratin sheath is so thick exactly that's i think the only way that that's possible I don't know. It doesn't seem like it'd be strong enough to be very useful in defense. The only way that it might be useful, though, is that if the keratin makes them look a lot larger, then it's a defensive mechanism in the same way that like a cobra's puffing out of its neck skin <laughs> to look more intimidating is a defense mechanism. It's more. It could be more of an appearance thing right. than like an actual physical like bludgeoning weapon. <laughs> As usual, they also said it could have been used for sexual attraction, which isn't surprising because that's one of the main uses for horns is just like a big display structure. Like, look how amazing I am. I got these big old horns. I'm really good at finding food so I can grow these big horns. You should mate with me. (laughs) (laughs) Weirdly, though, they also said that it could have been used for temperature regulation. And it doesn't seem like horns are much of a temperature regulation kind of structure. No, but that same hypothesis has been proposed for stegosaurus plates. Yeah, it's a strange one, the temperature regulation one. It seems like there's better ways to do this. But then again, it could be a combination of things. So maybe they grew them originally for defense, for example, to look bigger because maybe there were bigger, badder predators around or something and they needed to look tougher. And then that also led into a sort of sexual selection thing because the ones that weren't getting eaten and look tougher are more attractive. And then maybe on top of that, it helps them regulate some temperature. So they just took advantage of all these things. It's not uncommon for like a single structure to serve multiple purposes. Yeah. 
I just had an image in my head of that Land Before Time scene where I think it's Littlefoot, Ducky, Spike, and Petrie fell into a tar pit and they get out, but they got out by climbing on top of each other. And so they have these tar and sticks sticking out. Oh, yeah. And then they scare Sarah because they look so big and scary and like a much bigger animal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> Because a lot of it is just that first instinct of how big is this compared to me? I better get away from it. Yeah. Plus they had the sticks coming out that reminded me of the spines. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. The other interesting thing about, especially if they were keratin covered, it makes the spines look much bigger in addition to just how massive that these <laughs> bone spines are coming out of the back. Based on the reconstructions that they showed, the keratin covering almost doubled the length of the exposed spines because there's the portion of the spine that's still in the neck. You know, it has to reach the skin before you can actually see it. And then that additional part that sticks out, they added like another almost 50% to that piece. So you could see how that would really improve their chances at finding a mate if that was sort of a selection criteria because keratin is probably easier to add on top than it is to grow the bone that much bigger. They made a really awesome replica of Bahatosaurus too. They have one of sort of the fossil, so the, the kind of thing you're used to seeing in museums where it's just the bones. But then they also made a sculpture replica so you can really see what it might have looked like in real life. And that one, one thing I really like about it is they have these coloration patterns on the spines and they colored it differently, sort of where the bone runs out and then where it's just keratin continuing on. So you can kind of get a feel for just how much the keratin impacts the overall appearance of the dinosaur. It's really neat. They sort of recreated from maybe about the 10th vertebrae up through the head. And so, yeah, they're, and they're kind of curling down. And the way that they textured that keratin sheath is also really cool. It sort of looks like the ring texture that you see on an antelope horn, if you know what I'm talking about, like a whole series of rings, like it was built. Oh, yeah. Like ridges along the horn. It also kind of reminds me of rebar, that sort of texture to it. Mm -hmm. That was the texture that they gave to the Bahatosaurus spines. That's fun. Yeah, it looks pretty tough. In addition to that spine, that's really cool. I actually think that the skull maybe even cooler because it's the most complete skull we've ever found for a dicreosaurid. So it really gave us a lot of information about sort of maybe potentially their feeding habits and things like that. They found that its eyes are near the top of its skull, which possibly indicates that it had its head facing down to eat low plants. And it had teeth that were a lot like a diplodocus. And the overall skull shape, too, reminds me a lot of Diplodocus, which isn't too surprising because we've previously thought that Dicreosaurids are closely related to Diplodocus, and so we call them Diplodocoids, sort of the larger Diplodocid-ish <laughs> group of dinosaurs. So I think the previous recreations of a Margosaurus skull were pretty close because they base, it looks like they based them on Diplodocus by my eye. So pretty cool. I hope we find more of this guy. I'm a little bit curious if the spines actually did curve as far forward as this find makes them look, because there's a possibility that that's a preservation issue oh, and right. it got bent during fossilization. And it could be that this whole bent spine thing is blown way out of proportion because we only found one. So you can't like compare a whole series of them and say, oh, well, it's unlikely that all of them would bend in the same way at the same angle and stuff. But when you only find one, it's like that could just be a preservation thing. At the very least, it would feel weird to have a bunch of bent spines. <laughs> yeah, it seems really strange. And on top of that, it's like you couldn't really do a backward bend like you're doing the limbo or something because it looks like its spines would have run into each other. It looks like it could only kind of bend forward or flat. So I don't know. <laughs> Need more fossils. Yeah. And now, almost as good, in my opinion, best <laughs> early dinosaur discovery, Nathovorex. The paper was written by Christian Pacheco and others and published in Pure J. It's an open article, too, so you can look at it if you want. It's from Brazil. It's not a sauropod. No. Is that what makes it so interesting to you? <laughs> sort of. What really makes it important, though, is that it's a very early dinosaur. 
So this one is named Nathovorax cabrerae, and Nathovorax translates to the Greek for jaws inclined to devour. Wow. In other words, it has good eating mouth. (laughs) (laughs) Teeth. Yeah, there we go. Strong teeth and jaws. That's quite the name. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And then Cabrera Eye is after the paleontologist who found the fossil. And there's actually a really excellent YouTube video of the whole find and kind of the process of the find, the prep work, the fossils themselves and all of that. Unfortunately, it's all in Portuguese. Unfortunately for me, at least. (laughs) Not unfortunately for any Brazilian listeners. And there's no subtitles. But they do show Sergio Cabrera finding out that it's named after him. Oh. And it's really awesome. He's like so touched by it. It's really cool. That's nice. Yeah, it's a good video. Even if you don't speak Portuguese, I enjoyed it without that. (laughs) So on to what Nathovorax actually is. So it's about 233 million years old. And somehow, despite being that old, it's in really amazing shape. And if you're familiar with when dinosaurs evolved, you know 233 million years old is way at the beginning. It's like probably within 10 million years of their the very first dinosaur so it's very important and in the paper they say it's quote the most complete and best preserved herrerasaurid dinosaur ever found end quote and they pointed out that herrerasaurus the herrerasaurid herrerasaurus (laughs) is pretty well known too but it's a composite of individuals so it's not one individual dinosaur that was found they had to piece together what herrerasaurus was from a bunch of different individuals whereas this one nathovorax was found as just one individual and is incredibly complete it's really awesome cool it's also only the second herrerasaurid ever found in brazil and the other one was found about 80 years ago it's been a while (laughs) yeah so nathovorax includes a nearly complete and articulated skeleton oh that's nice Yeah, it's basically only missing bones that can be inferred from their mirror image, like the right leg. It's got like the complete tail, the complete skull, a complete arm and leg and ribs. And I think it even has gastralia, if I was looking at the skeletal drawing right. But yeah, it's a really, really great find. And the skull is in really good shape too, which is awesome. That's better preserved than... A lot of dinosaurs, not just Herrerasaurids. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's in the the very upper echelons of well-preserved dinosaurs for sure. And the fact that it's from the Triassic, when usually the older you get, things start to get more sparse, it's just extra awesome. So quick background on Herrerasaurids, because we don't talk about them that often. Like I said, they're not all that common. They only existed during the Triassic. They were extinct about 10 million years before the Triassic ended, so... There aren't all that many formations that have herrerasaurids, mostly in South America, and even then they're usually pretty fragmentary. But what we do know about them, in general, herrerasaurids are relatively small. You can think more of a Deinonychus size than a Utah raptor size. So um, that's smaller predator, I I would say, somewhere in the four to six meter sub 20 foot scale so yeah pretty small small. for a dinosaur yeah and the authors call them medium to large bodied and i think that's because triassic dinosaurs were in general a lot smaller than later dinosaurs so at the time it was pretty big so it was one of the bigger predators for sure but yeah compared to something like a t-rex or an allosaurus or something this one's pretty small and it also was a lot skinnier than later carnivores at that same length so just the length alone doesn't really give you the full picture of it Nathovorax also had a boxy head. It was kind of like an early sauropodomorph. You could kind of think of Platyosaurus, kind of, that same sort of early... Well, the early dinosaurs had a similar look. Yeah, they did. And they don't look particularly well adapted for anything. (laughs) Kind of generalists is sort of how they look, with a, a head that doesn't look like it had really strong jaws. And with Platyosaurus, you're like, really? That could do anything with plants, even? Like, what <laughs> what's going on? This one has really sharp teeth, so you can tell, like, the authors named it. You know, it's intended or inclined to devour. But, yeah, it's not really an apex predator like you'd see in something like a T-Rex, sort of really functionally designed for crushing bone or ripping through flesh. And it also has some other really weird features that all herrerasaurids have, like having five toes, <laughs> although only three were really functional. So it sort of is theropod-like, but, you know, if you look at the bones, you can tell it's different. Yeah, it's early days. Yep. 
And like all the early dinosaurs, it was bipedal, and the hands were also superficially theropod-like, probably good for grasping. It had pretty curved claws and, you know, hand-like hands, not T-Rex weird fingers or like Carnotaurus little baby arms. (laughs) This one still had real arms that could actually pick something up. In general, I think Herrerasaurs are basically like an early attempt at theropods that just didn't quite pan out. It has a lot of the same sort of attributes, but it's just not quite there yet. And because it has so many weird features and also because they're so not well known, you know, we have a lot of fragmentary individuals. They're one of the most troubling groups for paleontologists to fit into cladograms. So to in, or, in order to fit them into that early dinosaur family tree and see where they fit, it's really hard to do. Sometimes herrerasaurids are separated from all the other dinosaurs and they're al- totally alone. Like I think that often happens with Ornithoscolida, if I remember right. Herrerasaurids kind of be off on their own. Sometimes they get included with Sauriscians, and even when they're included with Sauriscians, they can vary where they exactly are. Sometimes they're basically like a sauropodomorph, probably because its head looks sort of like a platyosaurus. Sometimes they're more like theropods because of the toes and hands and things like that. Um, but the consensus now seems to be that it's a little bit more like a theropod than anything else. So back to Nathovorax. Nathovorax is 2 million years older than Herrerasaurus, which is only 231 million years old. It's just a little baby. (laughs) (laughs) And Nathovorax was found in the southernmost state in Brazil, which I think is pronounced something like Rio Grande do Sul. Most Herrerasaurids come from Argentina, and like I said, this is only the second one from Brazil in general, so it's pretty cool. And fortunately, this one was found near Santa Maria, And even more fortunately, in Santa Maria, there's a university with a paleontology program. Mm. I don't really know if that's the fortunate side. It might be more like the only reason it was found is because there's a museum there with a paleontology program and then they noticed it. Or someone nearby knew about dinosaurs because of this paleontology program. It all worked out. Yeah, but it's another good example of why we need local paleontology programs in as many places with dinosaurs as possible. Because that's how we find new and interesting dinosaurs for the whole world to appreciate. Looking at the skeletal, it's in really amazing shape. Like I said, it's pretty much completely preserved. And in its head, its teeth do look very carnivorous, but they're not quite like any other dinosaur that I've really seen before because they are definitely carnivorous. They're very sharp and they're curved pretty strongly backwards. So, you know, it's good for keeping things in the mouth if it's struggling or otherwise tearing it off and making sure that it ends up heading backwards towards the stomach (laughs) where you want the food if you're this nathovorax. And it has a very defined premaxilla. So that's sort of, if you're familiar with the way Spinosaurus looks, and it's got that front part of its snout that is very distinctly separated from the rest of its mouth on the roof of its mouth. So it's got a few teeth that are a lot smaller in the front there, and then there's a little bit of a gap, and then there's some more teeth. You also see it in Dilophosaurus. It has a pretty defined premaxilla. This is the same kind of thing. And then there are the biggest teeth right in the front of that maxilla, right after the few small teeth in the premaxilla. And then they just kind of evenly get smaller as they go back in the head. So it's almost like the opposite of our head, where we have like the big molars in the back. These are just getting tinier and tinier as they go back. It's really interesting, really weird dentition. Better for devouring, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking maybe these teeth in the back are mostly there just to make sure the food doesn't like fall out of the mouth and keeps heading in the same direction. Kind of like the weird teeth that mosasaurs have on the roof of their mouth. They're not really there for chewing or slicing or anything. It's just kind of there to keep the stuff going in. Turtles have something similar too. That's my best guess. I don't know. It looks weird. (laughs) Some of the unique things that this dinosaur has is it has just three premaxillary teeth, which we haven't seen in other herrerasaurids. It also has three bones in its pinky toe. So even though I was saying, you know, it's got five toes, but it mostly uses three, the one that it's not using, the pinky toe, is still, I mean, three bones in it. That's like as many as our pinky has in it. So (laughs) this is a reasonable number of bones. It's not completely vestigial and going away at this point. And I think the weirdest thing is that its tibia is way shorter than you'd expect it to be. It's actually shorter than its femur. And generally, fast sprinters have longer tibias than femora because 
there's this leverage equation that makes it better for hunting and better for running if you have a longer tibia or tibia plus metatarsal bones than the femur but this one doesn't even though it's a carnivore so it's kind of weird because its legs don't look like it would have been that great of a runner even though its mouth definitely looks like it was eating meat i don't know maybe it wasn't chasing anything that was all that fast or something i'm not sure maybe it went for carry-on as a scavenger yeah yeah i mean it probably did even if it could run fast because paleontologists always tell us you don't pass up a good meal true but you're right maybe it wasn't fast enough to catch the quick prey and it had to just kind of make do by being the biggest thing around and scaring away other animals <laughs> when they hunted something. I don't know. Another great effect of it having a really well-preserved skull is that you can actually see its brain case. So you can see how big its brain was and the proportions of different lobes in the brain, which we can use to infer what kind of behavior it might have had or what kind of senses might have been better than other senses. And based on the shape of its brain, we think that the part of the brain that's responsible for eye, neck, and head movement is really well developed. So it might have had that as an adaptation for hunting. So it was quick with the quick reaction speed with getting its head darting after prey, potentially. Since it's an early Herrerasaurid, they obviously had to do a good cladogram to see if this one helped fill out that whole puzzle of where Herrerasaurids fit in the tree of dinosaur life. And in their analysis, it came out as a Sauriscian, but not as a theropod. So it kind of pulled it a little bit farther out than some of the other recent analyses. And it actually came out as the very most basal Sauriscian. So right at that Ornithischian, Sauriscian split, Herrerasaurids immediately started doing their own thing, <laughs> at least according to this cladogram. And interestingly, too, Nathavorax was found right next to a Rhynchosaur and a Cynodont. And I don't really know much about those animals, so I'm just going to quote Riley Black, who said, quote, The bones of Nathovorax are framed by the scattered bones of weasel-like proto-mammals called cynodonts and tubby-beaked reptiles called rhynchosaurs, end quote. It's a good quote. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So I guess at that time, you know, mammals weren't doing so great. They were doing better than they were in the Jurassic <laughs> and the Cretaceous, but weasel-like isn't really... A great thing to be. <laughs> and then a tubby-beaked reptile also. Maybe it was prey? I don't know. We don't know. They did say in the paper that it looked like some of the animals might have gotten there after it was already dead and starting to get buried and stuff. So maybe it wasn't preying on these. We don't know. I do think, though, that that's a good reminder that the Triassic really wasn't the age of dinosaurs yet. There were still all these early mammal-type ancestors, like there was Dimetrodon is another similar to mammal. It's another synapsid, just like the Rhynchosaur. And since everything was so well-preserved, they did a CT scan of the skull, which is how they found out about that sense of sight and ability to quickly move the neck, potentially. And the 3D models are actually available on Morpho Museum. We'll have a link in the show notes for that one. Unfortunately, the skull is pretty smashed. You can download that, the original skull. But I think it could be kind of fun as like a pretend or practice dig or prep piece. <laughs> like you can bury it in some sand and uncover it or something. And there's also a really great model of the brain case with the inner ear. So you can see exactly what its brain looks like. You can print that out too if you want. You can print anything these days. You can, as long as the 3D files are available. We've also got an honorable mention for best early dinosaur discovery, Nota Tesserae Raptor. Yeah, it's an honorable mention because it's not as early of a find. Nathovorax is really like pretty much right in the Triassic where all the dinosaurs were diversifying. Nota Tesserae Raptor was a little bit later, but still really cool. And these early dinosaur discoveries, there were several of them this year that it was hard to pick between them. That's why we ended up with two. It was published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution and written by Marianne Zahner and Wynand Brinkman. And thanks to James for sharing it with us on Patreon. So this theropod specifically is from Switzerland, and its name is Nota tesserae raptor, Frickensis. And Nota tesserae raptor comes from Nota, which means feature, and tesserae, which is Latin for mosaic tiles. I think it's kind of like a tessellation, maybe the same root there plus raptor for predator, 
And they used mosaic tiles in the name because it has a mosaic of Dilophosauroid and Coelophysoid characteristics. I'm not really a big fan of the raptor usage, though, because it keeps coming up in all these non-dromaeosaur dinosaurs, and I think it's just really confusing. I think that was a thread on the dinosaur mailing list, too. Oh, it was? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the only restrictions that the ICZN has on names is that they shouldn't be confusing. And naming a bunch of non dromaeosaurs raptor is one thing if you do it accidentally, like Megaraptor, but come on. Then the species name Frickensis is after Frick, Switzerland, where it was found. And that's really just a few miles south of the German border, so it could have easily been a German dinosaur. Since I mentioned it's a mosaic of Dilophosaurus and Coelophysis, you might be guessing that it's from the Triassic. And Nota Tesserae Raptor is estimated to be about 210 million years old, placing it firmly in the late Triassic and making it one of the earlier known dinosaurs. Cool. Yeah. And not surprisingly, it's thought to be a predator too, because a lot of early dinosaurs were, plus both of those close relatives are also predators. They found the skull, which is full of really sharp teeth, and it had hands that looked like they might have been good for grasping, although they're on relatively short arms, so I don't know how good they really would have been. And both the hands and skull are in really amazing shape and are super rare finds. They said, quote, 90% of the skull elements are known, which makes SMF09-2, that's the specimen name, the most complete theropod skull from the late Triassic and early Jurassic of Europe, end quote. So being the most complete of not just the late Triassic, but also the early Jurassic, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And these skulls mean so much when we're trying to figure out behavior of dinosaurs and evolutionary patterns, because you can see such minute differences even in the dentition or say if it looks like their eyes or their brain endocast is developing a certain way. It's just, it's great to have stuff like this. In addition to some really great hands and skull, they found most of the torso, and by that I mean all of the ribs, the hips, and the vertebrae in between. They also found both fully articulated arms and a couple of vertebrae from the base of the neck and the base of the tail. So it's a pretty good find. A lot of times Triassic finds are pretty incomplete, especially things that are from Europe, but this one's in pretty great shape. Unfortunately, they didn't find any leg or foot bones, which can also be really helpful, especially in these early dinosaurs, but I'm happy with the skull. <laughs> you can tell a lot from the skull. You can. And Sabrina, you'll be happy about this. They also found gut contents. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically, what they found was the upper jaw of a clevosaurus, and I had to look that up. So a quick Erictodromius burrow tangent. Clevosaurus is from a group of reptiles, which is extremely similar to the modern reptiles Tuatara that live in New Zealand and can live to over 100 years old. Wow. To me, they look a lot like iguanas or a lot of these other modern reptiles, but it's pretty amazing that they live so long. Yeah. <laughs> and also the Clevosaurus bone that's in its stomach was only a few millimeters long. So they think that this ancient Clevosaurus was smaller than the modern Tuatara group. It's pretty cool though. And that probably means that this dinosaur was very quick because being able to catch a little lizard is not an easy task. Nope. Especially considering how short its arms are. I probably had to catch it with its mouth and <laughs> no other help. I can't imagine running and trying to like grab a lizard off the ground with my mouth. Face dive. Yeah. Not an easy task. The authors think that Nota tesserae raptor was still growing so the sizing estimates that I can give aren't really too relevant because usually we compare adults, but they estimate that this juvenile was around 3 meters or 10 feet long. At first glance, it looks a lot like a Coelophysis, especially since it doesn't have a large notch in the front of its mouth like Dilophosaurus, and it also doesn't have any head crests like Dilophosaurus, which are the two dinosaurs which we think it's most similar to. And since three meters would have been about the max size of a Coelophysis, and Dilophosaurus was around seven meters long, Maybe Nota tesserae raptor would have been in between, just kind of random speculation I'm making. But if they're all around at the same time, a lot of times different sizes is kind of how dinosaurs got their niche partitioning so they could all coexist. In their phylogenetics, it came out as a more basal neotheropod than Dilophosaurus, and it also came out as a slightly closer relative to Dilophosaurus than Coelophysis, which was surprising to me because I thought it looked more like Coelophysis. But since a phylogenetic analysis includes so much more, 
than just the shape of the head and whether or not it has head crests. This includes things like the length of different arm bones and shapes of fingers and things like that. All of those details must add up to make it a lot more like Dilophosaurus than Coelophysis. That's why we use phylogenetic analyses with powerful computers <laughs> that can compare like 200 things at once and not just look at a skull the way I would. Another interesting thing is it was found in the same quarry as several Platiosaurus specimens, although based on what we know, it probably wouldn't have been much of a threat to a Platiosaurus unless they were very small, like maybe hatchlings or an eggs or something. That's any dinosaur, though. That's a hatchling or an egg. Lots of threats. Very true. So moving on, speaking of filling in gaps, we got best gut contents. <laughs> yeah. Which is Microraptor in 2019. That was a great one. A Microraptor that was found with a complete lizard inside its stomach. And I really do mean a complete lizard. It means it died before it got digested? <laughs> I, I mean, I think everything dies before it gets fully digested. Where in the process of digesting it died could have been a couple minutes Hard to say exactly, but <laughs> this article is written by Jingmei O'Connor and others and published in Current Biology. Jingmei really cranks out the articles. It's oh, pretty yeah. crazy. Well, she told us she's all about the research. She really is. <laughs> and this is another really amazing find. So just a quick refresher on Microraptor from our dinosaur of the day. I think of it as basically a bulkier crow with teeth. So it's largely black, we think. It's around the same weight as a crow, although a little bit heavier, maybe like 50% heavier. It also had a feathery tail and feathers on its legs. But other than that, pretty crow-like, I would say. And amazingly, this is the fourth time we've found a microraptor with gut contents. We've previously found it with mammal bones, also with fish scales, as well as an enantiornithine bird, also known as another dinosaur, all inside different microraptors. So... This thing was eating all sorts of different things. <laughs> we mentioned during our dinosaur of the day that it might have hunted at night because it had a sclerotic ring in its eye. That might be a little bit out there because just about all dinosaurs had these sclerotic rings. But it was eating so many different things, you know, it could be helpful to at least be able to hunt at different times of day. Maybe you'd end up with more opportunities to catch things unaware. There's still a lot of debate over whether it could fly or if it was just gliding around, especially because of those four wings, because that's controversial whether they just created drag and maybe helped with gliding or if they could have flapped them in any meaningful way. And then also with the tail with feathers on it, what did that do to flying? It's weird. But <laughs> this paper calls it volant, meaning they think it was flying. Right, because we've also had scientists say that they think it could be for brooding or other reasons not related to flying oh for sure yeah why the hind limbs evolved feathers we've heard about like it finishes the circle of brooding it's kind of a fun hypothesis and i probably don't need to mention it but finding exactly what a dinosaur ate is incredibly rare and it's especially rare for figuring out specific prey sometimes we find things like some teeth or some bones and you can classify it as say a mammal or another dinosaur or something, but actually having enough bones that aren't all broken to smithereens where you can actually tell the species of the thing that it ate is really amazing. The lizard that Microraptor ate is also brand new to science, so they actually named <laughs> the lizard in this paper. Well, that's fun. Yeah, so a lot of the paper is actually about this lizard. They named the lizard Indrasaurus, and that's after the Hindu deity Indra, which was swallowed by a dragon in battle. <laughs> Fitting. Yeah, it's pretty great. I usually wouldn't bother mentioning the name of the lizard, except that it was a dinosaur slash dragon <laughs> eating a lizard, and they came up with a really good name for it. It appears to be a juvenile or subadult lizard, probably making it easier pickings, I'm thinking, because it doesn't look like it was fully grown, but it still takes up a very large portion of Microraptor's abdomen. Well, Microraptor wasn't that big. It wasn't. And this lizard is like, I don't know. It's, it really seems like it would have been tough for Microraptor to swallow this thing. There's some fun paleo art of it eating the lizard. And it's like, yeah, that's pretty much the limits of what it could get down its mouth. What if the lizard killed the Microraptor? <laughs> so I don't think that's the case. They didn't actually speculate on what killed the Microraptor, but it did fully swallow it. So yeah. it's like deep in the abdomen. It doesn't look like it kind of choked on it or anything. But maybe it weighed it down so much it couldn't get away from however it died. 
Yeah, like it couldn't fly anymore or something. Yeah, or run fast enough or something. I guess it's theoretically possible. We don't know. Sure. It, it doesn't really look like it got eaten because we didn't find it in like a copper light and it's still articulated, but maybe it could have drowned or something because of it. I don't know. <laughs> they didn't say. In any event, though, this lizard that it ate was definitely a solid meal. When I look at it, it just looks like a huge blob of bones in among the ribs and everything. But fortunately, these paleontologists are amazing at their job and they made a really nice drawing highlighting the skull, teeth, ribs, and limbs of the lizard so you can really see how it was arranged in the microraptor's gut. And once you see the drawing pointing everything out, you're like, oh yeah, now I see it. Now I can see where the lizard, you know, where its tail is and where its mouth is and everything like that. But before that, it's, it's really hard to see. <laughs> so basically the way it's arranged inside the microraptor is that the head is near the bottom of the abdomen. So thinking like kind of at the very bottom of the stomach, the legs are a little bit higher and then the tail is all the way up at microraptor's sternum. So it's really stretched out. It's not really all that compressed. And I kind of wonder if some of that might be taphonomy. So after Microraptor died and then it started to decompose, these bones maybe could have sprung out a little bit, like maybe the tendons on the lizard were holding together longer than the stomach of Microraptor was keeping it in a shape. It's hard to say exactly how that pieces together. I don't think there's been any taphonomy studies on birds eating lizards and how that works out. <laughs> but in any event, it does look like it ate the lizard head first, since that's what ended up in the bottom part of the stomach. And the authors had a really good line about that, saying, quote, the lizard is largely complete and articulated, confirming the current perception of Microraptor as an agile, opportunistic predator that, like extant reptiles, including raptorial birds, ingested small prey whole and head first, end quote. That's the easiest way to make sure your prey isn't fighting you back too much. <laughs> Just swallow the whole thing? Yeah, head first. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. Yeah, go for the head. Then it can't bite anything. Interestingly, they think the specimen is partly faked. They say, quote, it is extremely likely that the crushed skull has been manufactured and or enhanced. The morphology of the dentaries is inconsistent with other Microraptor, end quote. So they believe the rest of the fossil is genuine, but... Even just me looking at it, I can see that the teeth look completely wrong. The skull is not at all a microraptor. But other than that, it's a pretty convincing fake skull. Some of these fakes are really, really impressive. So I think it might be prudent to throw this microraptor in a synchrotron and double check the rock chemistry. It's amazing in the synchrotron. Different types of rock will light up different colors and you can see what it's made out of. And if it's from a different piece of rock you can usually tell that the striations and the chemistry don't line up the same. So I think that'd be a good idea. Maybe that'll be in a future paper. I think one of the most interesting things about this find, though, is that the microraptor eating the lizard is actually what preserved it. <laughs> because we talk all the time about how you don't find small animal fossils because a lot of small animals just end up as prey and they just get eaten. And then once they're eaten, they get, you know, smashed up and disarticulated and strewn all over the place. But in this case, since the microraptor died before digesting it or scattering its remains all over the place, it actually kind of wrapped it up in a nice little meat package. <laughs> meat package. <laughs> to be buried and preserved rather than it just scattering. Because something that small, it's so easy to lose the bones. Plus, if you're out in the field looking for fossils, noticing these little tiny fossils like a little lizard, is really hard to do, even if it does preserve. So it's pretty neat. We've talked before about this kind of thing happening in coprolite, but I don't remember ever seeing a new species named from inside another animal. It's just awesome. What an awesome meat package. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should put that on a shirt. <laughs> Next, we've got best amber find, Electornis. Yeah, there were quite a few good amber finds. And I expect a lot more in 2020. This find was published in Current Biology by Lita Shing, Jingmei O'Connor, and others, because of course Jingmei is on it. <laughs> she apparently is involved with all the most exciting research happening in China. Yeah, well, there's a lot, a lot going on. Yes, and this paper is also very well written. 
which I think might have a lot to do with Jing May O'Connor and why she's the second author on it, because it has a similar tone to some of the other papers I've read of hers recently. And the authors give a really good synopsis of what dinosaurs we've found in amber lately, saying, quote, so far, five bird specimens have been described from Burmese amber, two isolated wings, an isolated foot with wing fragment, and two partial skeletons, end quote. Of course, we've covered all of those over the last few years, and they are all amazing in their own way. There's also a tail that was in the mix too, which is really cool. That might be what's the partial skeleton could be one of those. This new dinosaur is named Alector Ornis Chungwangai, and Alector means amber, so Alector Ornis means amber bird. It's a pretty good name for a bird found in amber. Yeah. <laughs> it is r- really a dinosaur too because it's an enantiornithine, so it's a toothed bird, and these went extinct. They didn't evolve into modern birds, so depending on where you d- draw your line, um, what is a bird and what isn't a bird... You know, if you're a bird purist, you might not consider this a real bird. I don't know. Then Chung Guangai is after a curator who works at the Hupoga Amber Museum. And I have not heard of this museum. I tried to look it up and couldn't find anything about it. Sounds like it has to do with amber. Yeah, I think maybe it's in Myanmar and that's why I can't find it. A lot of times more rural museums can be really hard to find. Might not actually be rural for all I know. Could be in some major city. But in any event, this new piece of amber is really cool. It has a partial leg as well as some feather in it. And the feather looks like it's the right shape for flight. So that gives you a clue that it was probably flying. It has that asymmetry and everything to it. But most of the paper is really focused on the foot because that's the unique thing that gave it its name. So we had to compare the foot, (laughs) this amber trapped foot, to a bunch of other dinosaur feet to see if it warranted its own genus. And it did because the foot is really interesting. So it has four toes, which isn't too surprising. It looks like it would have been really good at perching because the first toe, also known as the hallux, looks a lot like modern bird feet where they do a lot of perching. It is 180 degrees almost from the other three toes. It sticks out the back. So it gets that good grabbing action for a branch that it's perched on. And one of the unique things about Elector Ornis is that its hallux is longer than some of its close relatives. So maybe it was extra good at grasping branches and perching. But cooler to me than that is the fact that since it was in amber, it preserved the keratin sheaths on its claws. And they saw that the keratin sheaths covering the bone claw, the bone part of the claw, made them about 33% longer than just the bones alone would be. So... If you look at any enantiornithines now, you might be able to assume that you take its claw and add another third to it, and that's how long it actually would have been. It's quite a bit longer. Yes, and a lot sharper, (laughs) because that's what happens when you can grow a fingernail, can come to a finer point. It also had really interesting scales on its feet. They were very small, around 0.1 millimeter in diameter, as well as significantly smaller than that. (laughs) So basically indistinguishable from skin at that point, but it looks really cool under magnification, obviously. And of the three toes that are facing forward, because we have the hallux facing backwards, but then you have more of a typical looking theropod three toes facing forward, the middle toe is much longer than the other two. And when you combine that extra long middle toe and the long hallux, it's definitely a unique characteristic, which is why it got its own name. And they came up with some really interesting ideas for why the middle toe might be longer, which are obviously all very speculative because we can't test what it was doing. One of the guesses is that maybe it was for climbing trees. The authors point out that there are some tree climbing lizards that have long toes. So maybe a lector ornus had a long toe for doing just exactly the same thing, wrapping around a branch or bark or something a little bit better with a longer toe. They also (laughs) pointed to something we've talked about a lot, which is a similarity to an eye eye, that weird lemur that eats bugs that (laughs) keeps coming up. We talked about it with hands on some other dinosaurs, which may have actually been wings, but we're not sure it's been proposed that they had these really long fingers for digging into things. And they're saying, well, maybe Elector Ornus used a toe 
like how an eye eye uses a weird finger to dig inside a little insect burrow or down a tree or into a little gap somewhere to fish out a grub or some other insects. Interesting that lemurs and dinosaurs have so much in common. <laughs> yeah, it seems like everybody's noticing the similarity with the long, weird digits that keep popping up on these dinosaurs. It's weird, especially weird to think of it on a foot, though. Even more interesting to me is that there are also these small hair-like scutellae scale filaments, also known as SSFs, on the foot and toes. And this is something you'd never see fossilized because they're basically like fine hairs sticking out of the fossil. But when it's in amber, you get to see this really amazing detail. So they also put out some guesses at what those might have been used for. They said possibly it could have been used for increased traction in a wet forest since wet leaves are very slippery. It's kind of similar to the sauropod claw hypothesis that Ashley and Lee Hall explained to us, you know, get a little extra traction. But now we think that it was used for digging, although it's hard to use hair for digging. <laughs> they also said that it could possibly be mechanosensory tactile function. And they cited a paper which I had to read by Susan Cunningham and others. And in it, they describe that a lot of birds have avian facial bristles. They were trying to figure out what they have them for. They kind of look like whiskers. You see them on kiwi birds. That was one of the main ones in their study, kind of things sticking out from their head. They look just like whiskers, basically. But they're obviously not whiskers because birds don't have mammalian hair. They grow these weird scutellae scale filaments, basically like a hair, except it's made out of the same stuff as a feather, and it sticks out from in between scales. So what Cunningham and her co-authors found was that these facial bristles may have been used for, quote, prey handling, gathering information during flight, navigating in nest cavities and on the ground at night, and possibly in prey detection, end quote. That's a lot of things. Yeah, it's really fascinating. So for prey handling, it's basically if you're holding prey, but you can't see exactly how it's moving, but maybe your bristles can help you feel how it's moving and you can respond so it doesn't get away from you. Is that similar to a cat's whiskers? I think so. I, I've heard with mammalian whiskers, a lot of times it gives the animal information about their width, that a lot of times their whiskers are equal in width to the widest part of their body. Mm -hmm. So if their whiskers don't touch something, then they know they can squeeze through it. Okay. So that's kind of like the navigating and nest cavities part. Yeah. Or, and I think in that case, they also might be thinking it's more of like a, when you're walking in a dark room and you put your hands out so you don't bash face first into something. Mm, as feelers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then there's gathering information during flight, which is really interesting too. It'd be like a windsock sort of thing is my guess at what that would do. You might be able to feel where the wind is going and react. But prey detection, I think, is really the one that they're thinking about, especially with the eye eye comparison, because what they found was that the longest and biggest SSFs are on the end of the long toe. So if you imagine you're sticking a toe into a crevice, and that toe has its own little whiskers on it, and it can feel real sensitive detail about what it's sticking into. Maybe it can tell if there's a little grub in there that it wants to grab onto. It's like having an eye on the end of a finger so you can see what's going on. Feel it rather than having to see it. So they're like little bug feeler hairs, potentially. Hey, whatever gives them the advantage. Yeah. And this is all very speculative. They do know that those SSFs are there. We're just not sure exactly what they're for. I like the feeling for bugs in a tunnel with your toe. <laughs> it's just like the strangest thing you'd never make up. Now we've got best biomechanics study, which is about how raptors use their claws. Yeah, I thought this one was fun just because it's so different than the way most people imagine it. And most sculptures depict raptors using their claws. So I think it was a good test on whether the pop culture is accurate. It's definitely a preliminary study. We need some cool models of raptors slashing at things to <laughs> suss this out. We have an update on how raptors like Deinonychus use their claws. And this is according to an article by Peter Bishop published in Pure J. 
So if you think about what raptors might have used their claws for, and of course, when I'm talking about their claws, I'm really referring to their second ungule, as it's technically referred to, but really we think of it as that curved hook claw that raptors are famous for. And there have been lots of proposed uses for this claw. So most famously probably is slashing, which is what they talk about in Jurassic Park. They talk about how maybe they were smart enough to potentially target a critical area. Like in the movie, they talk about disemboweling a small boy. Mm. (laughs) Or it could be, you know, cutting the throat of another dinosaur or maybe going for a large artery, something to that effect, because it looks like the way they're holding it off the ground, maybe they're saving it up and trying to keep it sharp to use it in a very specific way. And since it's right on its foot there, it's kind of like using a finger. You can be pretty precise about where you poke. (laughs) So that's one potential option. Another potential option is for gripping. If we think about things like Allosaurus, they have a good grasping hand and modern raptor birds use their feet in a similar way. They can grab onto prey and, you know, they fly away with fish and all sorts of different things. So maybe Deinonychus was using that extra long sickle claw to hold down prey. They could have also potentially used it for climbing. So they could have used it as is often depicted for climbing animals, say a Tenontosaurus or a hadrosaur or a sauropod that show it almost like using it like a crampon. I think <laughs> yes. one article described it like, you know, sort of climbing up the slippery side of an animal by sticking in the claw, then using the other foot to stick in Ooh. and then proceeding up. That's got to be painful for that other animal. It would be if it happened. We're not really sure if they did it because we don't have any evidence of that specific behavior. Another thing you could climb to, though, is trees. So a lot of animals have claws specifically for climbing trees, which isn't unreasonable. We know that a lot of dromaeosaurs had wings or at least wing-like things. And therefore, maybe you want to climb a tree to get to a nest or to chase down prey or to glide off of the tree to get somewhere else. Lots of reasons you might want to climb a tree. Another potential option is for defense. This is one I hadn't thought about before reading this paper. So they talk specifically about how modern birds kind of kick at each other when they're defending themselves against other birds of the same species. So they kind of flap their wings and then stick their feet out in front of them and kick at the other bird to try to keep them away. (laughs) And a lot of times this might be between males, rival males or something like that. You may have also seen modern birds that grab onto each other's feet and kind of play a game of chicken, like diving towards the ground. (laughs) Yeah. Do chickens do that? No. Chickens play in chicken? They do not. Uh, That's too bad. Chickens don't really fly much. (laughs) But yeah, the feet could be used for defense or some sort of intraspecific combat either among themselves or maybe against another animal, I suppose. If some smaller animal is coming at you, maybe you could just kind of kick at it and scare it away. And then finally, they propose that maybe they could have used them for digging. It's kind of obvious a lot of dinosaurs use their feet for digging or their hands for digging. There's lots of good stuff underground, lots of mammals. (laughs) especially during the Cretaceous that you could dig out and maybe have a snack on. Although this claw specifically, given its shape, doesn't look like it would have been a great option for digging. Still technically possible or maybe just an alternative usage, maybe not the main usage, but a side usage. So to test some of these, Bishop created a musculoskeletal model to try out some different options. Specifically, they just modeled one leg and foot of Deinonychus. So it's not all raptors, it's just Deinonychus. It's usually a good choice when you're looking at raptors because we have a good number of Deinonychus specimens to look at. You wouldn't use something like Dakota Raptor, then we just have the one (laughs) of. (laughs) And with their model of the Deinonychus leg and foot, each of these activities, whether it's kicking out in front of it, trying to climb something, digging, what have you, it's going to require a different force and a different angle of a claw. So if you imagine you're digging, you're kind of rotating the claw across, whereas if you're climbing something, you probably have the claw at a little bit more of a fixed position, and you're kind of just using the leg behind it to do the climbing. So it depends on which activity you're using, and maybe by looking at the muscle attachment points on the bones and what we know about modern birds and similar animals, we can figure out how they might have been able to bend their claws and which of these behaviors it would have best aligned with. So the models rely on accurately guessing the tendons and muscles of a Deinonychus. 
which is a pretty tough ask <laughs> because none of that has ever fossilized. So what they do is they make a bunch of assumptions based on what we can see in Deinonychus's bones and what we can infer from modern animals. First of all, they assume that there's a separate muscle running to that special sickle claw than there are running to the other claws. And the reason that they assume that is because we know that when it's walking with its feet on the ground, you don't see that digit on the ground. And in order to keep it retracted, the most reasonable way to keep it up while the other toes are down is to have a separate muscle there. So if you try to do it with your own hand, I was just doing this the whole time I'm reading the paper too, because <laughs> if you imagine just like holding one finger up for a really long period of time, it's really difficult and strenuous on your hand. And that's because all of our ligaments are pretty closely tied together. You know, when you bend one finger, the others tend to bend with it. But since Deinonychus, we know, tended to hold its sickle claw off the ground, it's most likely that it just had a separate tendon for that toe, so it didn't have this problem. The other big assumption that they made was that it used a single flexor and extensor muscle. So basically, it had one muscle to bend the claw down, and it had a different muscle to bend the claw up. Along with this, they opted for a model where the claw is passively raised, meaning that when it's in that upward position while it's walking around and it's not touching the ground, that's the neutral position. And then when it wanted to bend the claw downward, that required flexing. Mm. So it's a lot like our hand in that way, too. If our, if our fingers were pointed slightly higher up, when you grip something, that's when you use your muscles. Whereas when you're not gripping, they're neutral and just kind of extended. Right. And that keeps the claw sharp, right? Yeah, by keeping it off the ground. And it also uses the least amount of energy, which is why they picked it, because they figure most of the time it's just walking around. It's not stabbing stuff <laughs> or digging or fighting or whatever it did with its claws. So it would want that to be the neutral position, just up. But that means that the important muscle to look at is the one that flexes it downward. And that muscle they kind of used in a similar way to our arm. So they modeled it as attaching to that large bump on the claw bone. You know, there's on the inside radius of the claw, the curved inward part, there's a big bump on the bottom of it. So that's a big muscle attachment point for bending that claw down. And then if you imagine it's on your finger and then it goes down your hand, through your wrist, and then attaches at your elbow, that's basically how they had their tendon. And that's how our tendons are too. Because so many land animals have all these like really specific things in common, even across hundreds of billions of years. So it seems like that's the most likely scenario. And then they just use the one muscle and there's their biomechanical model. So after making these assumptions and then trying lots of different positions of the claw and different tension on the tendons and muscle strengths and all that kind of stuff, they came up with a maximum force of the claw that was just under 20 newtons, or four and a half pounds of force. Which, if you think about it, four and a half pounds of force really doesn't sound like all that much, especially for an animal that weighed 490 newtons, or 110 pounds. So it's a little bit weaker than it's shown in a lot of places. But interestingly, what they found was that the highest force was possible while it was crouching. Hmm. <laughs> so that's because the flex joints in that wrist and in the elbow, increased the tension on that tendon, and then that just increased the force available on the claw a little bit. And that led the author to assume that crouching is the preferred posture while using the claw, because if it had the most force available while it's crouching, maybe that means that it was crouching while it was using the claw. <laughs> it's really as simple as that. There isn't any proof to it. It's just kind of sort of like how you assume that it's going to not need energy to hold the claw up because it's doing that most of the time. You might assume that it would get its peak power from the position in which the peak power was available. Among all the options of different ways that it could use its claw, the one that they pointed out as being the most consistent with crouching is the grasping prey, specifically small prey. The one that's the least consistent is probably something like slashing at large prey with legs extended. So that's more of the Jurassic Park kind of idea of it reaching out and slashing at you. It doesn't seem like that would give it the most available force. And then the amount of force available on that claw being just four pounds of force wouldn't be a great slashing weapon. So it was more of a pounce on something and kill it there sort of attack style than a 
run up next to something and slash at it from the side, hmm. potentially. Pouncing raptors. Yeah, <laughs> which it, they do show that kind of thing a lot in Jurassic Park as well, especially in the later movies. Mm-hmm. Especially for the larger animals they're fighting. Yeah, or they pounce on people a few times. Oh, true. It's also consistent, they point out, with the quote-unquote fighting dinosaurs that Protoceratops and Velociraptor, which were found buried together, presumably in some sort of conflict <laughs> or fight to the death, <laughs> and they were pretty close together. So it looks like this might have been consistent, even though it's not crouching on top of it necessarily. It did have its leg in that flexed position that might have increased the force that it could have pushed with its claw. So like I said, Deinonychus weighed about 110 pounds, and if it could only do about four and a half pounds of force with the claw, climbing with the claw does seem a little bit unlikely. I guess the analogy would be like us climbing with a single finger on each hand, Ooh. which might be technically possible. I mean, it might have been technically possible for Deinonychus too, because if you hook in, you don't necessarily need all of that force available for moving the claw mm -hmm. as long as the joint can just support the weight, but it's just... There seem to be better options available for getting on top of something than trying to climb like that. It just doesn't seem like the best and most likely possible option. Another thing I should point out is that although the force of just four and a half pounds is pretty low, there's a lot of leverage on that claw, especially when you include the extra claw sheath, which would have been covering it while it was alive. So sort of like having the fingernail sticking out from the end of it. And that would have also made it incredibly sharp. So the pressure that this thing is capable of would have been, you know, thousands of PSI. So it would have been plenty to puncture just about anything that it would have encountered. So it's not an issue of, oh, these claws are really weak and they couldn't do anything with them. It's more that, well, they might not have climbed with them and they probably wouldn't have fought with their legs sticking out in front of them. Although I do wonder with the self-defense against other animals mm -hmm. you don't need that much force behind such a sharp blade to maybe deter something from attacking you right so it might be a reasonable secondary use when in a pinch yeah exactly <laughs> but the biggest caveat of the paper is that they didn't include other muscles in the animal's limb so specifically back to the analogy of our hands our grip is affected quite a bit by other arm muscles than just the tendons in our fingers. So if you think about when you're gripping something, the position of your arm makes a big difference. If you have your arm down at your side or above your head, it's harder to grip something than if you kind of hold it in front of your chest. And that's because the other muscles in your arm are helping you to get that grip strength when it's in the right position. But we don't know what those muscles might have been in Deinonychus. <laughs> So maybe there's something in there that would have helped it when its arm is outstretched or when it's crouching that would have helped us to figure this out a little bit better. Also, the study only looked at Deinonychus, obviously. So even though you might broadly say raptors did X, Y, Z, this is just Deinonychus. Hmm. This is a velociraptor, even though I talked about the fighting dinosaurs, which is much smaller. It's also not Utah raptor, which was like 10 times as big. So there might have been different behavior going on with these other dinosaurs. I was also really surprised that the paper didn't mention Tenontosaurus anywhere in it because Deinonychus is very frequently found with that hadrosaur and Deinonychus is often depicted in paleo art, taking down Tenontosaurus, often in a group. It's for another study. Crouching Deinonychus, hidden Tenontosaurus. <laughs> You're all full of one-liners. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and actually, now that you mentioned crouching Deinonychus, hidden Tenontosaurus, maybe Deinonychus could have just crouched on the back of Tenontosaurus and gotten that extra force that it needed because there are other ways to crouch than crouching on an animal while it's on the ground. You can crouch on the back of an animal too. And if you know, you're know you on its head or its neck or something, I'm sure you could do plenty of damage. Although maybe the more likely scenario is that they just went after juveniles so low. And then it didn't really matter whether or not they could climb an adult because they were only going after juveniles in the first place. I think after saying need more fossils, the next thing you could say about a lot of dinosaurs is that it's really tough to be a juvenile. Yes, <laughs> especially an herbivore mm -hmm. because the parents tend to just bail on you. <laughs> they got to survive too. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> now heading back into a best type of dinosaur, our best hadrosaur of 2019 Comwesaurus. 
Yeah, that one we had we've talked about that one for years and how amazing it was before it got a name. So it definitely deserves a little mention here. And the article was written by Yoshitsugu Kobayashi and others and published in Scientific Reports. And in it, they talk about the Mukawa dinosaur, as we've been calling it for a while. I don't know, it might have even been over a year ago when we first heard about it. But its official name now is Kamuisaurus japonicus, or maybe Haponicus. Not really sure exactly. Probably depends on where you're from, how you'd say the species name. And we've been talking about it on and off for quite a while. It was actually found way back in 2003, and it was found in Mukawa. So that's a good reason to call it the Mukawa dinosaur. And then Kamui is actually a deity from Hokkaido, which is where Mukawa is. So its name literally means this local deity plus lizard. So kind of fits. And then Japonicus or Haponicus is after Japan. So it's the Japan Kamui lizard. Kamuisaurus is remarkably complete. That's why we've been talking about it so much for a while, especially for a hadrosaur from Japan. Usually dinosaurs in general from Japan aren't all that complete. And this one's been displayed quite a bit over the last few months. It's been shown in pictures kind of laid out and you can really see pretty much the entire skeleton just with a few bits and pieces missing. Cool. I think we've seen pictures of that leading up to this. Yeah, you've talked about it a few times. So there's hundreds of pieces. We're not missing any of the leg or arms when you combine the left and right because they're always identical, basically, but just mirror images. So if you combine like the bones that we have from the one leg, it always fills in the gaps that we have for the other leg and arm in this case, which is really cool. And then other than a couple of those little pieces of arm and legs that you can fill in, we're still missing a couple bones, mostly vertebrae, part of the skull and some claws. So there's it's not 100% complete, but it's really complete. <laughs> it's a relative of Edmontosaurus. They're very similar looking. So if you just kind of picture Edmontosaurus, but with a shorter head and overall kind of a slightly smaller build, you get a pretty good picture of what Kamuisaurus looks like. It may have also had a small crest in between its eyes, kind of like Brachylophosaurus. But unfortunately, we can only see sort of near where the crest attached to the rest of the skull because the crest itself is missing, as is kind of the closest part. So we don't have a great idea of how big the crest was. But there were some articles talking about how it had this big, fancy crest, which is a little bit speculative at this point. Based on the lag spacing, so those like tree ring growth lines that you get in dinosaur bones and any animals that have these periods of growth that kind of slow down, it looks like it was about done growing because those lines are getting really close together. So you can tell that over the years, it's not really getting much bigger. And when it died, this Kamuisaurus was about eight meters or 26 feet long, which is smaller than a Montosaurus, but obviously still a big dinosaur. <laughs> And they actually gave two weight estimates, which I think is really interesting. They said that it would be about four tons if it was a biped and about five tons if it was a quadruped. Because it could handle more weight? I think so. Yeah, like the arms would be supporting some of the weight and therefore the legs, even though they weren't big enough, maybe to hold five tons on the legs alone, if they had the arms helping, then maybe it could add that extra ton of bulk. Or maybe they're just thinking that based on the way the mass would shift. So if, if it had like bulkier arms and a bulkier torso, it would shift the center of mass forward and therefore it could have more overall weight that it wouldn't be able to just like physically sort of have around its hips is my guess. I don't know. They didn't really say why they had this. It's the only time they talk about the stance that it had. It's just sort of in there. It's like it's either four or five tons depending on biped or quadruped. Moving on to more description, <laughs> so I'm not sure. Maybe there's more papers coming out where they'll talk about why they think it was either a biped or a quadruped or why they can't tell. Kamuisaurus was found in a marine sediment, which is unusual for a hadrosaurine, not like the larger crested lambiosaurines, which were apparently constantly getting swept out to sea. We talked about this a little while ago. I think it was with fauna that were up in Alaska, if I remember correctly. They thought that there were much more lambiosaurines, so the big parasaurolophus type ones down by the beach. But then as you got up farther, maybe more towards rivers or just up in the mountains, you saw more of the typical hadrosaur, less exciting head <laughs> Montosaurus type dinosaurs away from the beach. But this one 
was obviously near the sea because it got swept out to sea. And Gizmodo called it a beach bum, (laughs) (laughs) which I thought was kind of funny. And since it got swept out to sea when it got buried, it was buried with a bunch of other marine animals. In fact, the museum where it's on display now is mostly marine stuff because that's what the formation is. And Kamuisaurus specifically was found along with some Mosasaur, sea turtle, and ammonite remains. So it was a pretty active marine environment going on there. There's also a pretty cool piece of paleo art showing all of those animals together, the ones that were kind of found in the same general vicinity. But I suspect that if there was a Mosasaur around a Kamuisaurus, we wouldn't have found Kamuisaurus in such good condition because it probably would have bitten some pretty big chunks out of it. And we'd be missing some of those bones that we did find. Maybe it went for the crest. (laughs) The tasty top of the head bony part. (laughs) The delicacy, yeah. (laughs) The closest relatives to Kamuisaurus are, not surprisingly, other Asian Edmontosaurines, which are Leongosaurus and Kerberosaurus, which are geographically the closest Edmontosaur relatives. So it's not too surprising that this one looks like an Edmontosaur. And its closest relatives are things that were nearby that also looked like Edmontosaurus. <laughs> but this is also consistent with Hadrosaurus arriving from Asia from North America, probably via Alaska. And they mentioned that in the article as well. So we're starting to see this idea that even though Tyrannosaurs seem like they might have originated in Asia and made their way over to the U.S., it looks like Hadrosaurus went the opposite way, likely starting in the U.S. and then migrating over into Asia. When exactly? We still don't really know. And Kamuisaurus is stored at the Hobetsu Museum in Mukawa, Hokkaido, Japan, which is very near where it was found. It's on the southern coast of Hokkaido, about 50 miles southeast of Sapporo. And Mukawa has less than 10,000 people in population, but a pretty good-looking dinosaur museum, or I should say natural history museum, since a lot of it's marine reptiles. So if you're in that area, it would be cool to see I think they might have Kamuisaurus on display. I'm not really sure. It was mounted and shown at, at least a replica of it was, at the Dinosaur Expo 2019 in Tokyo. And I think it might be back at the Hobetsu Museum now. I'm not really sure, but since it's so complete, it would make sense to put it on display. And coming from the same episode, must have been a good episode, (laughs) is Best Paleo Art 2019, Brian Eng's Dinosaur Thermal Regulation Infrared View. That was a really cool one. It was definitely my favorite piece of paleo art for the year. There's an article by Casey Holliday published in the Anatomical Record, and it's also accompanied by some really great new paleo art by Brian Ng. And in it, you see dinosaurs as if they were thermally imaged. So taking one of those infrared cameras and taking pictures of dinosaurs, but it's all drawn by Brian. It's really great. This article by Holliday et al., is all about a new feature that they discovered on the skull roof of many archosaurs. In other words, dinosaurs, birds, and alligators. And specifically, they were looking at this area that they call the dorsotemporal fossa. And that spot is basically the area right in between the eyes of an alligator. It's actually slightly behind, but if you think about the top of an alligator's head, it kind of has the eyes sticking out of the top of the head. (laughs) It's kind of funny looking because, you know, when they're below the water, they can just peek their eyes up in a super creepy, scary way. But in that, there's a little bit of their head that gets out of the water too. And that's the spot where they were researching. So what they found was that there's kind of this little shelf there. And previously, it's been assumed that that area was a muscle attachment point for the jaw muscles because there's an area right behind it, which we know is a muscle attachment point. And this sort of has a muscle attachment shape to it. Sometimes these broad areas where bones flare out are good for attaching muscles. But these researchers looked at alligators because they have a pretty good dorsotemporal fossa. (laughs) And what they found was that there weren't muscles attached there. Instead, what it was is a whole bunch of blood vessels on the top of their heads that go down to the eyes, brain, and spinal cord. And there's also a really great video by Brian Ng explaining this to go along with his paleo art. So what they describe is this method that alligators have for regulating their body temperature by pumping blood to this little spot on their head in between their eyes. And in order to test this, 
what the researchers did is they went out into like an alligator farm. <laughs> if you've ever seen these things, they're pretty popular in Florida. And they pointed thermal cameras at alligators at different times of day to see what that part of their head looked like. And what they found was that in the morning and when they were trying to warm up, they pumped blood to that area in their head to try to warm up. And so you see these little bright spots on the infrared cameras or in Brian Ng's version in an infrared drawing on the top of an alligator's head. So it's both a really useful way to warm up and cool down. And T-Rex had a very large dorsotemporal fossa on the top of its head, much larger than average for an archosaur. So we think that T-Rex must have been using this to really cool down or warm up. Maybe it's because it had a large brain and large eyes, and those created a lot of heat that needed to be dissipated or in the morning needed to be warmed up extra, and therefore you'd want to get the blood moving and warming up to get the brain functioning <laughs> fully. I don't know, but they show some really good evidence in this article that alligators use this spot on their head to warm up and get their blood pumping. <laughs> and tyrannosaurs have a very similar aspect on their head. So it's really cool. You should definitely check out Brian's blog post on this so you can see this picture. It's really great. It shows a Displetosaurus guarding a killed Ceratopsian from some Dinosuchus. So the Dinosuchus have these bright spots on the top of their head, and so does the Tyrannosaur, although the Tyrannosaur is largely brighter in general because we think that they were a little warmer bodied than the crocodilian type animals. But the coolest thing to me about it is that the ceratopsian that it's guarding, you don't even really notice because it's room temperature because it's dead. So it's sort of blended into the background and you only notice it because it's blocking part of the Displetosaurus. So really cool picture, a really cool paper. It shows that there was something basically hiding in plain sight all this time that we just assumed was a muscle attachment point. But it turns out to be this new function that no one had thought of before. Next, we've got the best video short, which was Sharp Teeth. It's great for people who are Land Before Time fans. Yeah, or just fans of dinosaurs in general. It's really cool. David James Armsby, who has a YouTube channel, Dead Sound, recently released a short film called Sharp Teeth. It's less than three and a half minutes, but it tells a really compelling story about dinosaur life, mostly around ceratopsians and theropods. The animation was gorgeous. I really enjoyed it. The story is told via narration that rhymes and it's really cinematic, just really enjoyable to watch. Yeah, I really enjoyed it too. I, I found it separately, I think on like a subreddit or something. Yeah, it's making its rounds. The dinosaurs are pretty accurate too. Like some of them have feathers. It's a really good story. It's sad in some ways, but it also shows how animals are just living their lives. And you know, there's two sides to every story. I don't want to spoil it too much. I mean, it is only three and a half minutes, but <laughs> it involves mother dinosaurs trying to protect and feed their young. David also made a making a video that was really cool, and he did a lot of research. He said he's loved dinosaurs for a long time, and his desk is covered in them. And the animals in the video, there's Triceratops, Struthiomimus, that's the one with feathers, Alamosaurus, and then Pteranodon, not a dinosaur, but I said the animals in the video, and T-Rex, which is scaly. And in the making of video, there was a flash where we showed the latest Saurian post about T-Rex. And I think that's what caused him to make that, his T-Rex scaly. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. The latest, latest version from Saurian. Yes. Not the latest from a year ago yeah. where it was all fluffy. <laughs> so the video set in the late Cretaceous in North America. And David said that he purposely included some inaccuracies probably for the storytelling. For example, there's a line of trusting those who fly, like pteranodons, and that's not true. They would have gone after whatever they could easily eat. <laughs> there's also not enough eggs in the nest, and the baby triceratops is too big to be a newborn, he said, and triceratops probably didn't show that much parental care. And also he added grass. Those aren't too bad. Actually, grass, if we have triceratops, is probably okay. Because grass was evolving in the late Cretaceous. Yeah, but maybe it's the way he depicted the grass or yeah. something. I don't know. Those are pretty light. I, I, I think he gets a pass on all of these. Yeah. <laughs> he said some of the shots were inspired by walking with dinosaurs. 
telling this it's the storytelling through it almost, almost documentary sure, yeah. style yeah yeah especially i was thinking like in walking with dinosaurs they have some scenes where the puppets are sort of in the nest mm -hmm. like tending to eggs and some of the animation sort of fits with that yeah we also have best video which is my pet dinosaur on bbc that was a good one and the film, it goes over a lot of the basics of dinosaurs. It interviews a lot of scientists, and they talk about cool finds, especially the Red Gulch trackway in Wyoming, which may show gregarious behavior of theropods. There's also a twist. You might be able to tell by the name. The film is reimagining the world where humans live alongside non-avian <laughs> dinosaurs. And so there's scenes of a family eating dinner with a small dinosaur on a leash under the table begging for scraps. There's a clip that's like a BBC News clip. There's a bunch of raptors destroying some garbage cans and then they run to a car and then a newsman saying that people are unhappy because of property damage. Hmm. But like it or not, these dinosaurs are here to stay. They also talk about how smart dinosaurs were at the end of the Cretaceous, especially Trudon, and whether if it hadn't gotten extinct, it would have evolved and maybe changed to look like a humanoid called a dinosauroid. Oh, they're taking the Jurassic Park 4 approach. <laughs> that was one of the things, yeah. I mean, that film was less than an hour, so not too much time devoted to it. But they did have this dinosauroid and some scenes uh, walking around the city, reading a newspaper, getting coffee at a coffee shop <laughs> while there was in the background while they're talking to a paleontologist. <laughs> Oh, man. And then it ends with how the, quote, age of dinosaurs never actually ended, in quote, because of birds as we know. So, you know, technically we do live alongside dinosaurs. Some of us do have pet dinosaurs, like <laughs> parrots. They're very smart. And the film actually ends with a shot of a parrot. I think they say something like clever girl and then go to credits, something <laughs> like that. So we'll share a link to the video. It's about 50 minutes long. It's pretty entertaining and a lot of great scientists in there. Can you get it even if you're outside of the BBC? Yeah, I was able to watch it. I don't know how long the link will last. Sometimes they take it down, but Oh, gotcha. It's like on YouTube or something? No, it was on a news site and they oh. had it embedded. And Interesting. I thought it was going to be a short clip, maybe a trailer, <laughs> but it was the whole thing. <laughs> so you bit off more than you expected to chew. Yeah. <laughs> Please. But of course, we also have an honorable mention for best video, which would be Jurassic World Battle of Big Rock because Jurassic World. Yeah, it was. hopefully that's what the next movie's like. Many of you probably saw the eight-minute short film Battle at Big Rock, which is set one year after Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. It's directed by Colin Trevorrow. If you haven't seen it yet, spoilers, it's very short. You can watch it online for free, so no excuses. But if you haven't seen it yet, you might want to go watch it and then come back to this. Yeah, there was quite a bit of discussion on our Discord server about this and what was potentially inaccurate about it because it's not i mean it's jurassic park so you don't expect it to be the most accurate thing ever but <laughs> sure but i do like the concept i yeah i did too yeah i thought it was a pretty fun scene so basically the story is there's this family camping at big rock national park about 20 miles away from the mansion where the dinosaurs escaped from oh really jurassic that's where World it's supposed Fall. to be yeah and according to Colin Trevorrow, it's, quote, the first major confrontation between dinosaurs and humans. And Trevorrow co-wrote this with Emily Carmichael, who's also co-writing Jurassic World 3 with Emily. And he said, quote, it felt like a first step into a larger world after the last film. You have these animals loose in an unfamiliar environment. They're disoriented, struggling to adapt. The first people they run into are bound to be camping. I wanted to see that. It's really interesting because there's a little girl in it and she immediately recognizes the ceratopsian and it's not triceratops but she's just like oh it's a pseudoceratops or something mm -hmm. and you're like okay well if these are i had assumed that they were all over the place so she was familiar with what kind of ceratopsians were out and about i'm willing to bet that if this was the first time a human saw it they'd be like that's a triceratops i don't think it's the first time they saw the dinosaurs it's just the first confrontation but we're 20 miles from the place where they re were released. So wouldn't it be like they were camping and they got released like a couple hours before? And they then... got released a year before. Oh, it's a year before? But yeah. this is the first confrontation. So that's what Colin Trevorrow said. Although I thought I remembered hearing the family talking about, oh, do you remember at school they talked about these other incidents? And maybe these are smaller incidents. It does say major confrontation. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of weird. 
Yeah, so it's one year after Jurassic World. There's an Allosaurus, which is it was a juvenile in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Now it's grown because it's been a year. They don't grow that fast. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but it also looked really weird. The Allosaurus, when I saw it, I thought it was supposed to be a T-Rex. But then you notice it's got those bumps by its eyes. And you're like, oh, is that supposed to be an Allosaurus? But it's got that super wide Tyrannosaur-like jaw. Mm -hmm. So it's just like all Jurassic Park things. It's got like a Tyrannosaurus sort of ratio of skull to make it look tougher. But I wish they would have made it like an Allosaurus head. The nice narrow and not big T-Rex teeth sort of head. And it would have been smaller and quicker, which would have actually worked better with the scene. Right. And so the scene is... There's this family camping, and they're about to sit down to dinner, and then they notice that the campgrounds have gone completely quiet. And then they see the Nasutoceratops, and it's totally fine in the beginning. It kind of feels like we're watching them watch a show, because mm -hmm. they're seeing it through the glass of their RV. And the Nasutoceratops is just kind of looking for food, sees the fire, and then a baby pops up and everybody's admiring the cute baby. Yeah. Oh, baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know what else likes babies? Carnivores. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So then they attract the Allosaurus and that's where the fight begins. At one point, another adult in the Pseudoceratops comes in too. So then you've got the whole family fighting. And so you, you kind of figure it's over because you've got the two ganging up on the one so you figure oh, okay they'll be safe and that's what the people in the rv are saying too like oh it can't take on both of them so it'll have to scamper off right but then the nasutoceratops family leaves and something attracts the attention of the allosaurus to the the human family's rv yep kind of hearkening back to some of the scenes in the other jurassic parks where a kid makes a noise when they shouldn't <laughs> yes Oh, that's what it was. There's a baby that cries. Yeah. And then you've got the crazy scene of the Allosaurus attacking the RV. Yeah, and RVs are notoriously flimsy, so it just tears through that like nothing. Mm-hmm. Which they did a really great job capturing the terror of that scene. Yeah, I thought I enjoyed it as much as a lot of the scenes in the most recent Jurassic World movie. I did like how it ended with the girl, I, I don't know exactly how old she is, maybe eight or something. Yeah, that ballpark. Yeah, she ends up saving the day with a crossbow. It's pretty epic. Which I was saying in the Discord server too, is a little weird because a lot of these dinosaurs are like bulletproof. They were shooting them and the bullets just kind of bounce off. But arrows are like, they're kryptonite apparently. <laughs> <laughs> you shoot it with an arrow and it's a goner, but you could shoot it with a you know, whole clip full of ammo. And Maybe if you get totally it in fine. the exact right spot. I guess. I don't know. Could be. But I really like this idea of the girl saving the day. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of funny too because they were yelling at the neighbor like, don't teach my daughter how to use a crossbow. And then she saves the day with a crossbow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then the end of the film, there's clips of other humans interacting with dinosaurs and other animals. And they've got Compsognathus, Stegosaurus, Parasaurolophus, and then the Mosasaurus and Pteranodon. Yeah, I really like the Stegosaurus one the best because it's basically somebody driving down a road and then they come out of a tunnel and there's a Stegosaurus right there. So they have to swerve to avoid it. And I was just thinking, yeah. That would happen. That would definitely happen. The largest thing anybody hits on a road nowadays is a moose, which is probably a quarter the size of a Stegosaurus at most. And that would just, that'd be a nightmare. I'm surprised there wasn't any mention of people hunting dinosaurs. Maybe that comes later in the movie. Yeah, that's true. You would think that with these big herbivorous dinosaurs, they'd be pretty good eating. And if they'd been loose for a year... Well, I guess dinosaurs don't breed that quickly, so you don't you wouldn't have to call them quite like deer, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> or kangaroos. <laughs> but you could imagine some of the smaller ones, like Compsognathus or something, there'd be serious epidemics of them, you know, like a blight of Compsognathus running across the city, like a huge horde of coyotes eating everybody's pets or something. Then there'd have to be big efforts to try to combat them. I hope that's where this next movie is going it seems like it is because mm -hmm. it's sort of showing that transition now which i think is the most exciting thing you could do with a jurassic park movie is my favorite part by far of the second jurassic park lost world where 
you had the T-Rex in San Diego and just imagining how like people deal with this dinosaur getting thrown into their world in a pretty realistic way nobody's really fully explored before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited to see where this movie goes. Yeah. So apparently for this short film, they shot it over five days in Ireland last winter. I wonder if it'll be like Game of Thrones where they have multiple places around the world they film. Oh, yeah, that'd be cool to not just see it in the, you know, California forest sort mm -hmm. of environment, but to also see maybe what they're doing in like cold environments and hot environments and which mm -hmm. dinosaurs they show is like suited to those places. Right. Maybe some bigger cities like they alluded to Las Vegas at the end of the last movie. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. So what is it? We got about another year or two. Then we'll find out. June 2021. A little less than two years. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, if you haven't seen the short film yet or you want to watch it again, you can watch it online and we'll post the link to YouTube. And then last, we have Best Dinosaur Thought, which this one I think is controversial between us and our Patreon community. But <laughs> anyway, sauropods squishing turtles. Sure. It's controversial? Well... I seem to be the only one who defends the sauropods. <laughs> oh, you mean on Discord? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of an update from, I think we had a best of item last year too, where we talked about this. Yeah, just keeps coming up. It's just such a fun thought. It's worth multiple best ofs. There's a new paper that came out in Paleo Archive Papers about a marine turtle that got trampled by a sauropod in what's now Switzerland. Sounds like a rampage. No, it's trampled. <laughs> <laughs> they think that the turtle was already dead and then got stepped on. Mm -hmm. So not a rampage, probably. Typical sauropod sympathizers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. This paper was authored by Christian Puntaner and others, and it happened in the Jurassic. A sauropod stepped on a Plesiochelis biglari. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Don't know turtles too well, but that's an extinct sea turtle. And then crushed it. And it's not the first time we've talked about sauropods crushing turtles. Actually, sauropod vertebra picture of the week talked about this. A sauropods stomping turtles and how this isn't depicted enough in paleo art. Mm-hmm. I wonder why it isn't depicted in paleo art. Is it a conspiracy? I don't think it's a conspiracy, Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, the turtle was in a tidal flat environment, and the shell was found under a sauropod trackway. It's possible that the turtle died at sea and then was washed up on shore, but it's also possible the fossil was crushed by the weight of the rocks above it over the millions of years that it was buried. But the authors think it's more likely that the turtle crawled across this tidal flat and then was stranded and died, then the sauropod came by. Maybe it was looking for an easier way to walk through the area rather than go through a forest, and then it stomped on the turtle. So most likely, Garrett, the turtle was already dead, and this is based on characteristics of the shell, though the authors say that there is no definitive evidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, apparently there's cases of modern elephants crushing turtles, so this idea of a very large animal crushing a smaller one is not unheard of. I was trying to get to that sweet turtle goop squish it and then slurp it up i don't think that's what elephants go for or sauropods even at least not on purpose the sauropods are so big they probably don't even see the turtles that's possible yeah but it could be tasty could be you get tired of eating leaves all the time you see a turtle stranded right opportunistic eating and we talked about before too if the sauropods have to bulk up really fast and if they want more protein mm -hmm. find a turtle i don't think it's on purpose <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I think it happened. Maybe sauropods have eaten turtles at some point, but I don't think in most cases it was on purpose. I think their reputation of being a gentle giant is at stake. <laughs> they could still be gentle giants, just not if they can't see you. Or just not so gentle to turtles. <laughs> I guess so. And that wraps up our best of 2019. But I also want to mention that Sabrina did an excellent job in our 250th episode talking all about the Bone Wars. And if you're interested in the Bone Wars, you should definitely listen to that episode. I think it was one of the best episodes of the year and best content of the year, but it is a very long episode. And so if I put it in here, this episode would be like four hours long. So instead, <laughs> I'll just say if you haven't heard that episode, I think it's worth a listen. 
Thank you, Garrett. That's really nice, all the compliments you said. It was a lot of fun to work on that episode, and I got a lot of nice feedback from it. So if you feel like listening again or you hadn't heard about the Bone Wars yet, then please check it out. Episode 250. It's kind of like a best of the Bone Wars in a way, because it was such a long story (laughs) (laughs) over so many decades that putting it into a podcast in and of itself is basically a best of. And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to remind everybody that we have all sorts of awesome I Know Dino merch featuring three fabulous dinosaurs. There's a Gorgosaurus, there's an Allosaurus, there's a Parasaurolophus. They all also include I Know Dino on them in one way or another, and you can get it printed on all sorts of different things. Shirts, hoodies, pillows, notebooks, stickers, mugs. Lots of things. Lots of things that are appropriate for cold weather, too. You can get a mug and a hoodie Mm. and a pillow and snuggle up. Oh, you can get a notebook and write down your New Year's resolutions on it. Ooh, now you're thinking. Make them dinosaur themed bonus points. Or keep track of your New Year's resolution if you've already made it. Yeah. Now we're thinking. (laughs) (laughs) But if you're interested in anything dinosaur related, definitely check out our store. And it's at bit.ly slash I know dino store. And that link is also on our website and in the show notes and stuff like that. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Foodalongosaurus, which was a request from Ricardo via Patreon. So thank you. One of the bonuses being a patron. And just a quick note that this dinosaur has an interesting spelling, but I did look up the pronunciation. So hopefully I'm getting it close. Yeah, I've, I think I've seen this misspelled before because it's got the futa part <laughs> and then it's not long l-o-n-g it's l-o-g-n mm-hmm. i have seen it spelled a couple of different ways but i think the official spelling is the way garrett said which is, involves a g followed by an n which i have no idea how to pronounce so we're just kind of pronouncing it like it's long even though it's l-o-g-n anyway futalongosaurus was a titanosaur sauropod that lived in the late cretaceous in what is now argentina in the Portozuelo Formation. It was originally estimated to be uh, 105 to 112 feet or 32 to 34 meters long, but in 2008 it was estimated to be 85 feet, 26 meters long. Gregory Paul estimated that at most it was 98 feet or 30 meters long, though that's hard to say since most of the tail hasn't been found. Yeah, that's always the conundrum, like we mentioned with Scott Hartman. The number of vertebrae you put in your tail in your reconstruction can really make a big difference. Yes. So they did estimate the length with the tail based on proportions of other titanosaurs, though paleontologists do need more fossils to get a better idea of its actual length. They do think it's comparable in size to Puertosaurus and Argentinosaurus. There's one paper that says it was about 15 to 25 percent smaller. And at the time when it came out, it was considered like, well, this is one of the biggest dinosaurs ever. Yeah, over 100 feet is definitely a pretty exclusive club. Mm -hmm. It's also estimated to weigh between 38 and 50 tons. So Futalonchosaurus had a strong, large neck, and that shows a little more diversity in titanosaurs. Its neck had 14 vertebrae, and it had tall neural spines with a shark fin shape. It also had large, bulky hips that were almost 10 feet or 3 meters wide. Wow. Yeah, it's a big guy. <laughs> <laughs> the type species is Futalonchosaurus ducai, and the genus name means giant chief lizard. And that name comes from... Mapuche, and Futa means giant, and Lonco means chief. The species name is in honor of the Duke Energy Argentina Company, which sponsored the dig in 2002 and 2003. So the fossils were found in 2000, then collected between 2002 and 2005, and described in 2007 by Jorge Calvo and others. And at the time, the team described it as, quote, the most complete giant dinosaur known so far, which is pretty good. Maybe a little bit hyperbolic. (laughs) (laughs) but 70 percent complete is awesome yeah especially for something so large yeah the holotype included a complete neck dorsal vertebrae ribs pelvis and one caudal vertebrae from the tail it was a titanosaur so you might already know it was herbivorous it probably lived in a warm tropical climate and that's based on fossilized fish and leaves that were found near its bones They also found more angiosperms than gymnosperms in the area which may mean that futalonchosaurus ate lots of angiosperms. And as a quick reminder, since we're not a botany podcast, angiosperms are the things that evolved pretty late in the Mesozoic and they're flowering plants. So they're everywhere now. It's like what all fruit comes on, basically. Mm-hmm. But 
back in the Mesozoic, if you're thinking about things like ferns and cycads and stuff like that, those aren't angiosperms. Yep. So to be surrounded by angiosperms is pretty unique and it might, you know, maybe it had a different kind of diet or something. A tastier diet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would say so. Other animals found in the same time and place as Futolongosaurus include pterosaurs, fish, crocodilomorphs, sauropods, theropods, ornithopods. Many of the dinosaurs are not yet formally described that have been found with it. And specifically, though, there was Megaraptor and Unanlagia. Awesome. Hopefully they describe those other ones soon. They must not be as complete. Otherwise, they'd probably have higher priority. <laughs> and our fun fact is all about ourselves because it's the best stuff. <laughs> so let's talk about ourselves some more. <laughs> but it's that there were about 47 new dinosaurs published this year, and we've covered 40 so far. So next year is going to begin with a bunch of new dinosaur discoveries as well, because we have to play a little bit of catch up. But I say about 47 new dinosaurs because it's always weird. They do these things like where they publish and they sort of pre-print the article. So the print publication date is very often different than the online publication date. So which year a dinosaur was officially published in can vary depending on who you ask. And there might be a couple I missed. I did quite a bit of scouring to find these. And I think there are 47, but there could be more, which is almost one a week, which is usually the way we say it in shorthand. And that's really close. One of these years, we might end up with more than one a week. That'd be cool. Yeah. It's good job security for us. Stuff to talk about. <laughs> I'm not worried about that. Yeah. Well, that wraps up our first episode of 2020. Quick look back at 2019. And we're looking forward to what the new year brings. Don't forget to subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any of our new episodes. And if you want to join our growing community, check out our page, patreon.com slash I know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Goodbye.